We're going live in three, it's two. And we're live. Welcome back, hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Red Dot Forum Camera Talk. This one I think a lot of you guys have been waiting for. It is uh, exciting. But before we get to that, just want to uh, thank our, our usual team with me uh, is Josh Lehrer. Howdy. I am David Farkas. Producing the show, we have Jose Rivera. Hello, guys. And always, as always, hanging out in the comments, we've got Kirsten Vignes and Peter Dooling. So thanks to the whole team for uh, making the show happen. Obviously, two of us can't, can't do this whole thing. So always appreciate that. All right. So today is exciting. That's right. Well, we got... this is the conclusion of our it is. seemingly endless, but actually just <laughs> four-part series on Leica M mount lenses. Wow. So what lens or lenses are ah. we talking about today? Today we have an entire show dedicated to the 50 millimeter focal length. So if you are a 50 millimeter enthusiast, as I know many of you are, or interested in learning more about like a 50M lenses, stick around. It's going to be good. It is going to be good. So we've obviously amassed quite a nice collection as we try to do. So um, OK, so got to ask. Yes. How many different 50 millimeter lenses do we have on the table here today? Um, I believe I have 16 distinct variations, not including special editions, different colors. There was a few I couldn't get my hands on, so I tried. But, uh, you know, our friends from around the country who always loan us stuff for these yeah. shows have helped a lot. And I've got the ones that I feel like are the most relevant. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Again, there may be two or three that we don't have um, that I did try. <laughs> I tried to get. We did real good with the 35. We had one true, of everything. True. Um, 50 is, there's, there's a couple of really rare pieces that. But um, I think we have some kind of special and unique pieces oh, yeah, which we'll talk I, about. I don't, I'm actually amazed to see this collection all together in the same place. Um, yeah. And we're going to talk about a lot of it over the next several hours. So, yeah. Yeah. Not several hours. Yeah, usually, <laughs> Let's, usually several maybe hours. Maybe you and I will talk about it for several hours, but on <laughs> camera, it's going to be... Well, we usually go about two hours, so about I think... two hours. I think, you know, 50 millimeters is the classic mm -hmm. lens. When you think about what like, what are the first Leicas come with, what are the first lenses most people get when they get any camera. Yeah. It's, it's, 50 it's pretty, a 50. Pretty, 50's there. I mean, we were just talking, even when the M3 came out in 1954, there was actually three 50 millimeter lenses available yeah. at that time. Yeah, that's pretty wild. You know, with a brand new lens mount. Yeah. And yeah. you had the, the Sumerit, the 1.5, mm -hmm. the Elmar, the 3.5, mm -hmm. and and the standard bearer, the, the Sumacron, the, the F2. Yeah. And the Sumalux. So there's actually four. Four, wow. Like, there was four, because there was the Lux. Yeah, that's crazy. It's crazy. I, the the Sumerit and the first version of Sumalux didn't last very long. Right, so, right, right. You know, but still, that kind of shows you. And then if you look at like a current portfolio, mm -hmm. Of all the different variations they have, they have more 50s True. than anything else. True. Yeah. It's so, amazing. so what do we have in the current lineup? And I can kind of point. Current, here. we've got um, start at the top. We got the 50 Noctilux, which comes in black or silver. 50.95 Noctilux. Mm. We've got the 50 Apo Sumacron. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna. Yeah, we'll we'll get back to yeah. Each we're one gonna of we'll these, do close up later. We got the 50 Apo. I don't want to. Yep. Too cool. 50 Apo is here. We got the 50 Sumalux Aspheric, which is in black and silver. Um, 50 mm. Apple comes in black and silver also. Yep. We've got the 50 Sumacron version 5. Right here. Current version. Right here. That's the Safari edition. Um, and right. that's There's it. There's a black one. We had, up until earlier this year, the 50 Sumerit 2.4. That was discontinued. They're still... Still have one right here. Yeah. There's still some kicking around used, probably new somewhere. But then we've got, you know, the variants of these lenses. So that's a lot for one focal length. It is indeed. When you really think about it. And they range in price and size dramatically. <laughs> um, they do that as well. And then, of course, you start looking at Leica's back catalog, mm -hmm. a segment of which we have on this table right now, and you realize how much there's been <laughs> in the For last 60-something sure. years right. of making lenses. Yeah, lots and lots of 50. I, I would say that they probably made more 50 millimeters through the years yeah. than any other folks. They did. I mean, I ran, yeah. you know, I ran the calculations yeah. when I did my little spreadsheet, and they made... Like, 35 is a close race. Right, but they did make more 50s. More 50s, um, yeah. And it, the thing about, like, a 50s, and I'm sure as David and I go on and on today, we'll probably either miss something or misspeak about something. And I say this because there are so many variants... Mm -hmm. And a lot of variants where they didn't change the product code, they didn't change the catalog number. Right. They didn't. 
oftentimes even admit up front that there was a change. <laughs> you read about these lenses in the Leica collector's yep. books and stuff like that, and you, you get them in and out, and you realize, you know, I could show you four lenses that look totally different, mm -hmm. but that inside are exactly the same. Right. Or I could show you two lenses that look exactly the same, that but inside the same, are totally yeah. different. So it gets a little crazy um, mm -hmm, with mm -hmm. 50s, especially when you talk about versions versus catalog numbers and what changed optically and what didn't and all this stuff. Um, we're going to try to cover as much of that as we can here because there is such a rich history of, of lenses, big and small, rare and, and common, affordable, very expensive, and, and really the whole range. Um, and then special editions and all kinds of ridiculous stuff. Um, I would say basically there's yeah. a 50 for everybody. I would agree with that. Um, mm -hmm. And again, we are talking about 50 millimeter M lenses today. Oh, yeah, I know yeah, we yeah. there's screw mount and mm -hmm. arm mount and an SL mount and all that stuff, but these are, I know, we're, so we're not like we're forgetting those. No, we're, we're not just forgetting. Trying they, to keep it focused on. They do exist. On 50s. They just yes, don't we exist do. We, we do. on this table. Um, so I want to start with a question that I know we have already, but I'm just going to okay. ask you, David. Sure. We, we, did, we did an episode on, on wide angles, telephotos. We did a whole show mm -hmm. on 35 millimeter. Mm -hmm. Now we're doing 50. If I'm either to say new to Leica or maybe not, what's going to make me choose a 50 over another focal length, like I say a 35 or a 28? I mean, that is a question that I hear a lot. Yeah. And it, it's the reason is because we've kind of all been there. Uh, I would say that, that most M photographers getting into camera for the first time are pretty evenly split between 35 and 50. Mm -hmm. And obviously Leica has been making both of those focal lengths for a long time, yeah. making excellent lenses in both of those focal lengths. And it really comes down to how you see the world. And, you know, 35, some people could make an argument of it. I think we spoke about two hours about 35 <laughs> making <laughs> that did. argument. Yes. How it's a standard lens because it's how we see. Um, Although that's, you know, but that's really not that simple, of course. It's not that simple. Discussed, yeah. Right. And some people see in 50. You know, when they look at the world, they see 50 millimeter. When some people look at the world, they see 35. And the reality is 50 millimeter, at least in the 35 millimeter standard, as we're talking with Leica, mm -hmm. it's not a telephoto and it's not a wide angle. It is exactly neutral. Mm -hmm. One X. It's one X. Yes. It's exactly what, what you see with no magnification, positive or negative. Yeah. And I guess it's a neutral palette. You can pretty much do whatever you want with 50. You can use it for portraiture because mm -hmm. it's not going to have distortion like a wide angle would. Mm -hmm. You know, you can back up and get a whole scene and you'll still be able to get coverage. It's just a matter of how you want to use it. And yeah. my very first lens that I owned was a 50 millimeter F2. Now, it wasn't a Leica because, right. you gotta know. Start, gotta start somewhere, it's okay. I was 14. <laughs> uh, but a 50 millimeter f2, and and I think I mentioned this in the last episode, which is my father who got me, you know, a used camera with a 50 millimeter lens. When I said, "Oh, I want this lens, I want that lens," he's like, "No, you need to learn how to use this lens first before anything else, because once you master a 50 millimeter, mm. then you'll understand the others." I think a 50 keeps you honest because mm. short of using a fancy one like an Octolux, <laughs> let's say just a 50 f2, and you put it at f8, yeah. You can't really lean on mm. a lens effect like crazy compression or distortion or anything like that. That's true. That's true. To make the photo, the photo is just you're, just you're just capturing a slice of the world, mm -hmm. and you have to rely on composition and lighting and all that to make a good photo, which is kind of um, that a is... challenge in its own way, but also I think makes the photo stand out that much more when you can nail it just right. For sure. 50, so. Yeah, you know, take a look at at photos that are you know. Put a 21 millimeter on, and yeah. you can make a lot of things pretty interesting. Right, exactly. You can go crazy. You know, I can take a you know 135, you know a three four, and, right. and like do crazy stuff. But the 50, it, it keeps you honest. I like, I like, it, it, it I really like that. So I, I think that's a good way to put it. Why don't we? Uh, I know we have a lot of questions. We probably have stuff in the comments. Um, we're gonna try to bounce around a little bit more into the comments than we usually do. I think because we really want to engage everyone that's watching. Uh, before we dive into that, I do want to upfront thank, mm. as always, mm -hmm. everybody who helped us gather this collection of lenses, uh, Gary and the uh, International Light Society, the LHSA, um, Javier, uh, Michelle, and of course, Julie <laughs> for letting me steal stuff. And uh, I don't think I'm missing anyone. Mm, if I am, I'm sorry. But anyway, thank you to everyone as always. Thank you. Who, especially at the last minute, 
interrupts their busy life to gather up their their special valuable lenses and put them in a box for me and send them over. Now that we're done with them lenses, I promise you I won't ask you for anything else until I need something. Right. <laughs> we won't ask you for any more 50 millimeter M lenses. That's right. I promise, promise. you. I yeah. promise you that. So I just wanted to shout them out. Everybody out. Again, we cannot put this kind of collection together without the help of a lot of people. Yeah. David and I don't just have all these lenses lying around. No. Um, it's you know it is a, an undertaking for us to do that. So. Um, why don't we start, Jose, with a question? All right, let's get started. With so many options, <clears throat> what should I consider first if I want to start a 50 millimeter collection? Hmm, that's a good question. Well, you know what's interesting about that? I'm going to yes. let you handle this. Okay. Because, but I, I, I like that wording, a 50 millimeter collection, mm -hmm. because something that, that we've been talking about and that we've noticed over the years is that more than any other focal length, a lot of people have more than one 50 millimeter. Right? Yeah. It, yeah. It, like, I don't know how many people have more than one 21 millimeter lens. Right. Or more Very than few. 190, yeah. right? Yeah. But I know, I know a lot of photographers who have a few different 50s. Yeah. So that's an interesting point. So where is a good place to start? Kind of a jack of all trades sure. you can build around a system. Absolutely. So what do you think? Well, I think a lot of it, of course, will depend on your budget. But if there's one 50 in my mind, that's like the... Not too hot, not too cold. It would be the 51 <laughs> Forosphere. That mm -hmm. lens has been around for about uh, 15 years. It comes. I'll show it. That's a 50 Apo. Oh, no, <laughs> I was reaching for that one. Oh, what about that one that's right next to you? Okay, I want it on an M. Okay. Yeah. Uh, there we go. 51 Forosphere is really, a, it's a modern lens with a beautiful rendering wide open that's really sharp stop down. It's not huge, it's not too small, it has a focus tab, focus. it has a retractable hood, it doesn't have any gimmicks, it just works. So if you're, if you're building a 50 millimeter kit and you know you want to have some fancy stuff and some older stuff, this is a good standard bearer for the middle. Um, they're you know, pre-owned, they're under $4,000, at least as of right now. Um, and they work really well. Film or digital, SL, M10 monochrome, M10R, M240, whatever. So this is a really good place to start. This lens comes in three flavors right now, which I'll mm -hmm. talk about. So what David is holding is the 51 Forest Spheric in black, or if you want to call it black anodized. They also make the 51 Four in silver chrome, which is here. So it's optically the same, and actually the same filter size and everything as the black version, except it is silver chrome, which means it has a brass barrel. So it's about it's 30 or 40% heavier than the black equivalent. Same optics, same filter size, same everything else. This is the last silver chrome lens that Leica makes as a production lens. They used to make a few others. Now all the silver ones are silver anodized, which means they're aluminum. 51.4 silver chrome. The other variant that you can still buy currently, um, I'll show it here, is the... Let me put this back. Well, here. It belongs. There we go. No, you want to do it here? Okay. I'm going to hold it. Got it. That is the 50 Sumalux Aspheric Black Chrome. This lens is also in brass. It is finished in black chrome, very much like the monochrome is. It's an E43 filter size instead of an E46. We'll talk about that later. And it has a removable black chrome uh, brass lens shade, which is very cool. So those are the three variants of the 51.4 that you can get today. So that was one. So that was a long explanation for one. Um, if I was going to start adding a second and a third, second, I'd probably go something vintage. Uh, hmm. Maybe not too, too old, but it depends. You've got a lot of options. I may suggest something like a 50 Sumicron version 3. Um, you want to grab that, David? Yeah. This is a nice blend of vintage lens from the 70s that's still very modern to use. It's easy to focus. It's not overly overwrought. So it doesn't have an affinity lock or any kinds of gimmicks. Very light, very small. Uh, take the back cap off so they can really see how small it is. Yeah, there's really, there's really nothing to it. You can identify the version 3 by the thick... Um, lens mount. The early ones, right here. the red mounting dot was actually on the lens mount. As they got old, newer later on, the mounting dot was moved to the body of the lens barrel. You can see this one actually, that dot fell off and somebody painted <laughs> a red dot on there. Please don't do that. Um, but if you see ones where the dots on the mount or on the barrel, they're all, this, they're all version 3s. Um, they just changed them at a certain point. So, so I'd probably go with the version 3, something like that. Mm -hmm. And then on the other side, I would get either a, a Noctilux 495 or a 50 Apo. Again, obviously this is all budgetarily dependent, but I'm just saying in a perfect world. Um, we'll talk more about the Noctilux later, yeah. but because the Noctilux is so large, you generally want to have another 50 to balance it out. You know, the 50 Cron version 3, 
and the 50 Noctilux are like polar opposites when it comes to size. So for sure. The Noctilux could eat, could eat it <laughs> for reference. <laughs> you could put it um, inside of it. So sure. I guess the point that I'm trying to make is you, with so many 50s to choose from, mm -hmm. 60 something years of 50 millimeter lens choices, you could have, I mean, seven or eight 50s, and each one is gonna give you a different look. It's gonna feel different. It's gonna handle different. It's gonna render different. It's gonna be a different price point. You could get 350s all under $2,000. You know, you can get a, a, an early Summicron, a Summerit, and uh, maybe an early Summilux if you can find one at that price point, or an Elmar, all for under $2,000, which is not bad for Leica lenses. Um, they made a lot of them. That's the advantage of it being so popular. Um, what is it? What are we looking here? Okay, we, got a, we got a yellow question. That's super. Technical, complete discussion on the $50. Yeah, so let's take that one. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how... Complete or like? Well, why don't we repeat the question? Because I don't think everyone else. Yeah, why don't you why don't you read it and I'll start and you can you can finish it. Okay, S J says, please please <laughs> please please double please double please get into a good and deep yes Josh deep <laughs> technical and complete discussion of the M fifty Noctilux and especially how it compares to the current Sumalux. I assume the Sumalux, a spheric that mm -hmm. we're just talking about. So recently. Um, Jose and I actually did this. We tried the Noctilux at 1.4, mm -hmm. point, the Noctilux 0.95 at 1.4 against the 50 Sumilux at 1.4, as 50 Sumilux is fair. Two current lenses. And the Noctilux, even at 1.4, still looks like the Noctilux, meaning it's got a very soft out of focus rendering, even softer than the 50 1.4 is, hmm. meaning shapes are less identifiable. The bokeh balls, you know, the little sort of spherical things have a, have a much softer fall off. And you have a little bit more vignetting. Mm -hmm. And the other big difference is if I were to draw a graph of, I mean, they probably do have these graphs, but of how they do. quickly you go from sharp to soft, starting from the center to the outward on the same plane, forget about bokeh, sort of like flat, mm -hmm. the Noctilux falls off much faster. So for center-weighted subjects, the Noctilux is fine. But if you have off-center subjects, I'd probably go with the Sumilux, just because it is sharper as you get out towards the edges. The thing is, the Noctilux is so much larger than the Sumilux yeah, I'll, that I'll show I don't the here. often... Uh, right there on the SL2. I don't often put them in the same category or in the same thought process because the exercise of taking them both out is dramatically different. Wait, let, let's just take a look at, at yeah. the actual size comparison. Right, the 50 Lux is an E46 and it weighs, I will tell you, 335 grams. The Noctilux is an E60 and it weighs 700 grams. So it's twice as heavy. The Noctilux 0.95 is twice as heavy, meaning you're probably going to have a grip on your camera or a thumbs up. Right. So we're going to want to bring an SL2. So I think when I look at a photo taken with the Noctilux, anywhere between 0.95 and f4, it's immediately recognizable to me that it's a Noctilux photo. If I, if I look at a photo taken with a 50 Sumilux, you really got to keep it between 1.4 and 2 for it to have that like a magic. And even then, it's not as distinct in the way it draws as the Noctilux is. But the Noctilux requires a significantly greater attention to technique. Absolutely. Um, you have to be so so accurate. Right, I mean, this is something we talked about of, you know, just basically if you breathe mm. or sway, boom, you're out, the depth of field on this lens wide open at one meter is one millimeter, one millimeter. Yeah. Uh, for those people in America who don't know the metric system, like it's eight. really, really, really <laughs> small. Yeah. Uh, you, there's no margin of error there. Yeah. So, and, and we can talk more a little bit later, because I, I saw there was some questions about uh, technique on the Noctilux specifically. Yeah. yeah. But here we're just kind of talking about more the the technicals of it, and and it is a pretty revolutionary lens. In you know, Leica was very proud of this. This is a Peter Carba design, where it's faster than f1, right? Yeah. I mean that's insane. Yeah. A point nine five. Yeah. They you know breaking the f stop barrier as it were. <laughs> well, like, they weren't the first to do it, but they were no, the best no. to do it. Yeah. So I mean. It is amazing the the sheer amount of uh, what what they call light flux that's actually uh, the lens has to handle coming through the lens through all the optics to be able to give that level of quality is quite extraordinary. It's orders of magnitude more difficult to make a 0.95 than a 1.4, mm. uh, and and that's some. It's not if you just look at the numbers, it's just one stop, right? And and change. Right, it's like, right. eh, but it's it could be five times harder to make a one-stop faster yeah. lens. That's why it's so much more expensive too. Right. And, it's and a lot more exotic materials. And a real testament to how good the 9.5 is, 
is when you put it against its predecessor, the F1, mm. which is unique in its own right. Don't get me wrong, I will talk about it more later, but how much better the 9.5 is than the F1, which was already a difficult lens to make, to yes. me is a real testament to how good the 9.5 is. So I don't think I would use the Noctilux every day. I don't right. think I would use the Noctilux all the time. I think for two reasons. One, the size and weight of it are a little prohibitive for daily use on an M camera, which is designed to be small. Number two, you don't want to use the Noctilux magic up. Mm. You don't want every single photo taken at one meter at 0.90. I mean, maybe you do. Who am I to tell you what to do? But I'm saying it's just, in, in my average level of experience, it would start to get a little repetitive and it would look like you're leaning on that well, technique a little bit. It's like what we talked about in the very beginning. If every single photo was taken with a 21 millimeter yeah. and it had that exaggerated wide angle perspective, yeah. it's like, wow, this is cool. Wow, that's cool. Is, do you have anything else? Yeah. You know, yeah. like at a certain point, I, I like, don't use the magic up. Yeah. It, it's, yeah. it's true. You, I like to tell people the Noctilux is not a first lens. Mm. It's not a second lens. It's not a third lens. It's like, it's like a, lens. No, it's like a, <laughs> like a fifth lens. Yeah. You know, once you have a full complete kit built up where you have focal length flexibility that you can create very different looking pictures, and you already have a solid 50 millimeter there, let's say a Summicron mm -hmm. or Sumalux, you know, solid 50 that you can walk around with that isn't going to break your wrist every single day. Yeah. Pulling a Noctilux into your kit is going to give you, like we said, it's another paintbrush. Mm -hmm. It's a whole different look because even if you don't shoot it at 0.95 every shot, even if you're shooting it at 1.4 or f2, it still has that Noctilux magic look. Yeah, and if you're going to shoot it at f8. What's the Don't point? Don't use an Octolux. <laughs> yeah. Hit a 50 Supercon version one and call it a day. Um, yeah. That's exaggerating. So hopefully that answers your question. Um, if not, obviously you can reach either <laughs> of us anytime you want, six days a week. So, you know, yeah. so we're happy to go, to go into it further. But that was a good question. Yes. Uh, what's next? Jose, what do you got? Or, yeah. So, yeah, I have some people asking about uh, comparisons between the 50 Noctilux and the 50 Apple M. Same thing. I mean, Very two different. totally different lenses. So. I probably wouldn't do portraits with a 50 Apple, and I probably wouldn't shoot landscape with an Octolux. I say probably because, who, again, it's subjective, it's whatever you want. I shoot portraits with a 50 Apple and love it. There you go, see? I, well, if I, I do a lot of car pictures. Mm -hmm. I love shooting cars with the Noctilux because I love the way that that renders. That dreamy look, um, yeah. Yeah, I don't shoot it with the 50 Apple that much because it's like, well, okay, mm -hmm. it's just like a technical drawing at that point. Yeah, okay. Um, I can see that. The 50 Apple for landscape, ugh, is insane. Great, yeah. We'll get more into the 50 Apple later, I guess, but. The, yeah. the 50 Apple requires its own discussion yes, separate of the Noctilux. Which we'll get to. But I guess yeah. what it comes down to is just because these lenses are the same focal length mm. doesn't mean that they're similar, if that makes a lot of sense. I would go even one step further. Yes. The 50 Noctilux 0.95 and the 50 Apple Summicron were designed by the same designer. Mm. True. Right? Peter Carver designed both of these lenses, mm -hmm. but for very different purposes. Yes. Yes. One for magic and look, and he is in love with this lens. Um, and the other is for technical perfection. What can be achieved in a 50 millimeter, 50 millimeter focal length? That's, in his words, the 50 Apo Simicron, the goal was what is the absolute best quality we can achieve in a 50 millimeter M lens? And yeah. with like no compromise, price, right. no object. Right, right, exactly. And, and that's it. I think the like in a perfect world, the 50 Apple and a 50 Noctilux together is, I, I know that's $20,000, but I'm saying in a perfect world, they are so perfect with each other because mm -hmm. they're so different. I've actually gone out with both and I've shot similar pictures with both just for fun. And it really looks like two different systems completely. For two sure. different effects, two different emotion, two different responses you get from looking at the images. I'm talking about wide open. Whenever David and I are discussing M lenses, you can pretty much assume we're talking about at or near ma minimum or maximum aperture. Yeah. I don't shoot at f8 and expect magic. I shoot at f8 and expect perfect sharpness corner to corner. That's so right. it's like the mindset is different depending on um, what I'm shooting at. Is that, is that my dog who just sneezed? No? Did I hear something? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so, yes, it does depend on your objectives and your budget. Mm -hmm. But again, 50 Apo, 50 Noctilux, they are so different. But both cutting edge in terms of technology. Yes. But focused in different ways, right? Yeah. Different that's, design goals. Well, I'm sure we'll get back into this, but let's keep moving so we'll make progress. Yeah. All right. Question from Adriano. Even though the Sumilux 
50 was designed in the early 2000s. How does it manage in the digital era? Well, Fine. <laughs> I think we should also, I'm going to back up just a second because yeah. often Josh explains this, but uh, between yesterday and today, Josh actually used all of these lenses on... Don't mind the dog slurping. <laughs> He's thirsty. We're Keep very going. thirsty. Keep going. All right. Uh, so Josh actually, as usual, went and braved a hurricane, mm -hmm. maybe. Which we didn't get. And, which we didn't get. He braved the idea of a hurricane, the threat of a hurricane, tested all these lenses on various bodies uh, to really get an idea of both center sharpness, corner sharpness, uh, focus fall off, the, the bokeh, yeah. Yeah. and also uh, resistance to flare, mm -hmm. all these different factors mm -hmm. with the standard you know, test setup. Mm -hmm. So Josh can answer these questions very specifically, but it's not just conjecture. I mean, we've actually, this is fresh data like yeah. taken today and yesterday. So do you wanna, you wanna take that? Sure, so the, the short answer is 51.4 spheric is, I would say the third sharpest wide open on a high-end digital M, M10R, M10 monochrome. And you may be saying, well, wait, okay, 50 Apo comes first. What's going to be this? Oh, no. second place? Here we go. I know. I, here we go. And, there, and my dog is, <laughs> come here, buddy. He's causing some trouble. And second place, 50 Sumer at 2.4 or the 2.5. And I talk about this every live stream. There's a dog here. Oh, I see a face. Is the And we're not talking about magic or any of that character. We're just talking about sharpness. Yeah. You know, what, getting the most out of M10R, M10 whatever. 50 Apple Sumacron is the best, wide open. 50 Sumerit, <laughs> second best. 50 Sumalux, third best. Mm -hmm. Center sharpness, they're all excellent. It's just when you start to get off center. Now, the 50 Sumalux, the bokeh, the softness, the quality Ooh. is amazing. It's really good. And when I shot it against all the, we were like three or four older Sumaluxes, that's when you really appreciate, like the gap between, let's say I, there's really four versions of the Sumalux, right? If you look at the quality of the bokeh between the first three, the gap is minor. Mm -hmm. But the change from the last version of the pre-aspheric to the modern aspheric was significant in terms of the smoothness, the way that it just makes these shapes like not easily definable, mm -hmm. but not spaghetti or all amorphous. Swirly. Yeah, it's really, 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 mm -hmm. really nice. Um, and that's the only M lens that you get that on without it being a Noctilux. Right. Because um, a Noctilux is a whole other animal. So, And it really is just one stop slower. Yeah. You know, it, it used to be the whole reason for a Sumalux to exist back in 1954, right? It wasn't for looking for that magic bokeh. It right. was, oh my gosh, I have 200 speed film <laughs> yeah, yeah. and I need to shoot in a dark place. That was the whole idea. That's why the Noctilux was created. Yeah. The Noctilux, as in King of the Night, right? Noct. Um, that's night, in case you don't know, in German. Mm -hmm. So that was created specifically not for the look, but more for the actual capability because the cameras were limited. Now we have cameras like the M10 Monochrome that can shoot at 20, 32,000 ISO, right? It's absurd. You no longer have to look at lenses only for the aperture capability right. of now they're creative tools. And we can go in the back catalog and look at that as creative tools. Yeah. But I think this is this is something that comes up a lot. And I'm sure I'm not staring at the questions right now, but I know that someone is burning to ask this <laughs> if they haven't already. Yes. Something that you said is gonna perk up some ears. Okay, tell me. Because you're making a claim that this modern aspheric lens with floating elements everyone accepts that it could be sharper, mm -hmm. right? But there's always this term that goes along with it. It starts with a C. What, clinical? Clinical, yeah. okay. Oh no, it's a new lens, it's a modern design, it's too clinical. Mm -hmm. I want a vintage lens because it's smoother mm -hmm. and it's creamier. But what you said, and the pictures I saw, mm -hmm. the test pictures, mm -hmm. do not bear that out. Yeah, that's Completely the, true, the opposite. Yeah. There is no clinical nature to the 51.4 sphere. It's, that's, it's almost like two lenses, because mm -hmm. wide open, it's closer to the Noctilux than it is to the Simicron. Mm, for sure. Top down, it's closer to the Apo than it is to the Noctilux. Right. So it really is It's a nice middle ground while still being able to take advantage of what a modern digital M um, demands. Yeah. If I eyes go to the 50 Apo, wide open. You know, in terms of, when I say eyes good, I mean, you know, it's corner sharpness, vignetting, and chromatic aberration, things like that. Technical perfection. But it's really, really, really nice. Um, I actually, 
I gained a new appreciation for it mm-hmm. over the weekend doing my testing. Because I've shot with it a million times. You just kind of get used to it. And then yeah. you, you get it in context where you start to look at it against 15 other 50s. And you go, you know what? That's pretty nice. I will say that more so than any other modern 50, or aside from the Noctilux, it mm-hmm. does require really good technique in terms of it's got to be calibrated right. Because mm-hmm. I, I had two copies and one was probably a little beat up. And I had to resort to live view to really get it right. Um, because it was probably out of calibration, even though, you know. Well, I think it's like, probably a it's probably a pre-digital sample. Yeah, that's my guess. Because they, they have made yeah. it for a while. So if you've got one that you've had for 10 or 15 years, I'd probably recommend getting it CLA and calibrated by customer care just to make sure it's like spot on. Yeah, with I think it's worth saying as well, Leica really revamped their calibration procedures, both for both for range finders and for lenses. Yeah. Around, it was actually around the time of the M8.2 and M9, so yeah. around 2008, 2009, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. all of that got completely revamped because they realized the demands yes. put on the lenses, even by the 10 megapixel M8, mm-hmm. it was like, whoa, yeah. we really need yeah. to tighten this up. And we didn't have live view back then, so no. you had to focus with the rangefinder just like, yeah. You know, so, film. so if you see any lens basically made, let's say, post 2009, Generally speaking, it is going to be tighter calibration than lenses made before that. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, be aware that you may not be getting the lens's full potential. I'd like to cross reference it with Live View when I'm not sure to make sure I can mm-hmm. see, okay, is my range finder calibrated? Yeah, it's really easy to see now. Yeah. Put on a tripod and just yeah. to shoot a, you know, sign and I can see. So, I mean, I really went all, all over Ooh. the place with that question and that answer, but hopefully that was satisfactory. Probably not, but yeah. <laughs> I'm trying. Jose, right. what else we got? Let's keep yeah, it. Yeah, there's a ton of questions coming in here. So, well, well, Jose, why don't you ask me something? David, find a question you like in the comments and then answer it when I'm done with my question. How's that? Unless you want to just dive in right now. All right, well, hold on. This is a all good right. follow-up. Hold on, Jose, what do we got? Another one from SJ, actually, just because I, I saw it, it pops out of me. Hmm. The 50 Summicron Apo mm-hmm. is an F2 mm-hmm. and not a 1.4. Mm-hmm. Why on earth is it so expensive? You can take this one. Because it's exactly what I mentioned. Beer Carba, in his own words, wanted to create this lens. Actually, little little trivia here. He designed the lens 10 years earlier than when it was introduced, which was in 2012, I believe, right? It came out with the original, with the M9 monochrome. Yes, for the Apple, yeah. Yeah, came out with the M9 monochrome. He actually designed it before the 50 Sumalux Aspheric came out in 2004. You're like, wait, what? But it's better than the other one. He couldn't figure out a way at that time that anybody would want to pay twice the price for a one-stop slower lens. But the level of precision required, the exotic materials required were just very expensive. It was. It's a very expensive lens to make. So he referred to it as a submarine project, basically kind of like he designed it, he worked on it at home, he had a big schematic behind his desk and just kind of floated by. And it wasn't until Leica hit a certain point in their business where they really started seeing the possibility of, of trying new things, of trying exotic things, that he says, you know, I have this idea that I've had for a while and take a look at it. It's a 50 F2, the first redesign in 30 years, but it's a lot better. And they said, okay, well, how much is it going to cost? He said, well, more. <laughs> Will somebody, is somebody going to be willing to pay three or four times the price of a regular 50 F2? Mm. And they, I guess the answer was, we don't know, but let's try. And it's been a resounding success. Yeah, they still sell very well and the user market's very strong. I think it's it's important to to separate the aperture question. It's not an aperture, right? It's not about aperture. It's no. just about quality, performance on an M camera, and nothing else. Yeah, that's what Un- it's all about. Uncompromising performance. But what's nice about the for the Apo is just how darn small it is. Um, well, I don't have the close up on me right now, but we'll get there. We're getting there. <laughs> um, it's really you know it's an E thirty nine filter thread, fifty lux is an E forty six. There we go. I mean, look at that thing, the little guy. Oh. Regular Summicron. It's actually a little bit. Take off the. A little bit smaller. A little bit smaller than the regular Summicron. I'm doing a bad job showing this. And it has a really nice integrated lens shade that like slides out. Look at that, sweet. So 50 Apo is a dream, because it's small, it's compact, it's light relative to an Octolux, and the quality is insane. 
I'm sure we have many people saying things in the comments that we need to be addressed. So, David, what do you, what do we got? <laughs> I'm, just gonna, I'm just gonna make Jose useless for a little bit. Um, oh, there's a lot. Oh, Let's boy. see. Oh boy. We can't get to all your questions. I'm sorry. Unless you want to stay with us for the next four hours. I apologize for staring away from I you know, guys. Yeah. Well, we do. Well, I mentioned at the top of the show, we do want to try to get to more of the live questions. Although we do take questions ahead of time, so if you email us or comment on the um, on the post when it's made on our page with the preview. Um, you know, you can do that, and we'll see it. Here, I got an easy question for you, Josh. Fire away. All right, because I'm just kind of going back to the top and mm -hmm. working my way through. Mm -hmm. And while you talk, I'm going to look for more questions. Okay. Uh, can you talk about the version two of the 50 Sumicron? Sure. So there are five and a half versions of the 50 Sumicron in one in, in one way. It's one way look. You can look at it. Uh, the version two. I'm assuming you're talking about what they call the version two rigid which is this lens right here. Um, Jose, if I can get a little go up a little bit. Yeah. Close up action on this bad boy. That'll look good against your shirt. Yeah. Well, yep, yep, yep. There. <laughs> there it is. Hey, there it is. This is the 50 Sumicron version 2, um, known as the 50 Sumicron rigid because it's not collapsible. The version 1 was collapsible. Um, this lens is interesting because it's almost as sharp in the center as a modern 50 Sumicron. Focus falls off very, very quickly. So it's certainly not a lens you would want for super clinical sharpness. Low contrast, especially wide open, fun on the M10, or excuse me, the M9 monochrome, the first monochrome. Um, this, this lens actually almost doubled in value after the first monochrome came out because people realized how interesting it looked on there. Um, I have a love-hate relationship with these lenses because I do love the way it looks. I'm not a huge fan of the way it renders, only because I'm a stickler for high, high contrast and corner sharpness. But it handles well. It's got a very nice scalp focus ring. It's got an infinity lock here. You can see right there. And it's not that big. I'll take off the uh, rear cap. So I think as an investment, <laughs> these are pretty good because they're not making any more. And you know, I gotta been... say, it's a really nice looking lens too. Yeah, that's, yeah, it looks very cool on a yeah. camera. Um, again, low contrast. Um, nice for portraits if you want a vintage portrait lens without going crazy with the lux because the vintage luxes are really soft, um, wide open in the center. This is actually surprisingly sharp uh, in but the center. Sharp but low contrast. Yeah, sharp but low contrast. It also has a cool hood, you know. So you know, it's like uh, which don't lose because you can't get them. Yeah, anymore. right. This after video lose the hood. Um, <laughs> so that's the version two. Um, now they also made simultaneous to. The version two, they made the what they called the dual range, which is this one, mm. um, which we will talk about a little bit later. But this was made at the same time. So there's a 50 Supercon rigid version two, and the dual range also sort of a version two. Well, that's why I said five and a half because right, it's like version two and a half. Um, Good. Yeah. What do we got in the comments? All right, I got a couple more here. Anyway, any for you that I can read? Tell me. Okay. Uh, well, we handled that one. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm on the cusp of buying my first 50 millimeter lens. Oh. I'm leaning towards the 50 millimeter Sumicron version five. That's the current version. That's the current Sumicron. Mm -hmm. But continue to hear about flaring issues with the lens. How big of a problem is this in reality? Now, I mean, I have also seen reports of this. Um, I haven't had that much issues with it, but I also don't shoot with a version five that much. So, because I'm a Sumer. My way. wife does. But, uh... So my wife uses a version five Simicron in black on her M246 monochrome. And she actually, her preferred photography is she likes shooting uh, dance and dance competitions, which is under a lot of stage lighting. A lot of it is heavily backlit stage lighting. And what's interesting is the flare that she does get, I just think is actually pretty cool. It's very cinematic looking, mm. kind of, especially on the monochrome, it, it's very, the, the images she's able to get wide open kind of has a, like a vintage Hollywood feel to it, kind of glamorous, and that that's what she's going for, so yeah. it works for her. If what you're looking for is a perfect landscape photography lens shooting into bright sunlight, yeah. then yeah, maybe you should be worried about it. But I think in general photography applications, just general travel, uh, indoor portraits, which I've used this a lot for portraits, no, no problems really. Uh, it's just when you get in these really, let's call it, extraordinary situations where you have a really strong backlight, then yeah, you can start to see some flare, but it can also be used creatively, mm -hmm. which is what my wife's using it for, because she likes that. There we go. So don't let it hold you back, 
But if that's a concern, we're gonna, I'm gonna go to Josh's suggestion. You might wanna consider, if you can find one, a 50 Sumerit. Yeah. Because you're giving up half a stop of aperture, you're getting a smaller lens, and it has no flare. So if that's what you're after, yeah. Sumerit might be the key. I know you can't buy a new Sumerit, so that's something to keep in mind, but. Yeah. 2.5 or 2.4, they're both excellent. Yeah, so, great. Yeah. yeah. Um, I want to talk about some of the, uh, covering on the subject of the 50 Sumercon version 5, I want to talk about a couple of the version well, 5s we that, have. That's an excellent follow-up, by the way, um, to exactly what we just said. You want to do that first? You want to talk about Yeah, no, let's do this because it's in the same okay. conversation. Well, let me ask a question and then, or do you want to, well, I'll answer this. You ask. Yeah. Okay, so uh, Stephen asks a perfect follow-up to what we just said, yeah. which is wondering if you can compare the Sumacron, actually it's a Sumacron version 4, which... Okay, That's an yes. interesting tidbit. Yes. We'll, we'll explain in a second. To a Sumerit 2.4 or 2.5. Yeah. Now, first, why is it interesting that what we said just a minute ago yeah. is accurate for the version 5 and for the version 4 Sumicron? Well, the version 4 and the version 5 are the same optical design. Mm -hmm. So if you shoot with a version 4 and you shoot with a version 5, the pictures are going to look the same, basically. Um, I'll hold them up so we can see them. Give me a second here to get the uh, close-up shot. There you go. There we got it. Okay. So I've got a version 5 right here and a version 4 right here. Here we go. <laughs> so the version 5 is the current version. It has a retractable lens shade like so and no focus tab. The version 4 has a removable lens shade that looks like this, like that. Very cool. And it has a focus tab. So the version 4 actually has a bit of its own um, cult following. Oh, thank you, Houston, for letting me borrow your version 4. Can't forget. Um, because of the fact that it's the same optics as the modern lens you could buy new, but it has a really cool hood, if you can get one with the hood, and it has the focus tab, which some people really like. So, Sumerit, compared to the version 4 and or version 5, I would say both Sumerits are pretty much the same, so we're talking about four lenses that are really two lenses in terms of the way they look on a camera and rendering. They, the Sumacron definitely has a, a softer bokeh. Mm -hmm. It renders the transition from highlight to shadow smoother than the Sumerit does. The Sumerit is sharper in the center, in the corners. I would also say it's much yes. higher contrast as well. Higher contrast, you want to just put the, put yeah. the in there. So um, we're talking more contrast yeah. and more sharpness. Yes, yes. But less magic. So the Sumerit is also really easy to use. It has a very fast focus throw. It's very light. It's just the lens is like That's a set it, it. a set it and forget it type of lens. It's got a focus tab, which is nice, unlike the version four. So you'll get more recognizable, more distinct images with a Sumacron version four or five wide open than you would with a Sumerit. But you'll get a higher contrast, easier to work with, more consistent across the frame image with a Sumerit. Yeah, and it's tiny. So depending on the yeah, take take the hood off there. So depending on your objective, I could argue for either because they work well. Um, the Sumerit is an E46 filter size. It was actually a larger filter size. That's just because Leica wanted to make all the Sumerits the same filter size when they reissue them. But not on the um, original. Original so Sumerit, yep. there we go, is a 39. So that is a difference. It's got the kind of the slide-on yeah. pocket. It does have a screw-on shade, which was optional. Right, you have to buy the hood separately. With the, with the 2.4, it came with the hood, which was nice. Uh, but and either Sumerit, they're very similar optically. They may be exactly the same, I don't know. But um, you can't go wrong with either one. They're both excellent. It's just like a, it's a lens you don't have to worry about. You don't have to worry about, and that, that's good and bad. You don't have to worry about any real magic, <laughs> which is fine. <laughs> but also, that's not what it's for. Different tool for a different task. Well, so. like you said at the top, it it doesn't lie. Like yeah, it, well that, that's the most honest of all the fifties. Yeah, yeah, that's very true. And also one of the most affordable modern ones, like the most affordable modern fifty um, you can find. So that's a good comparison. Yeah. All right. Um, what do we got? Okay. <laughs> so here here's a great question. Uh, actually, we're going to just loop back to this. Okay. So, uh, Tom asks, Carbis says the 50 millimeter Simulux M Aspheric 1.4 is an apochromatic design, an APO design, uh, though it doesn't say on the lens. Do your test results confirm this? No. <laughs> Sorry. I don't, I'm not worried about, when I'm doing my testing, I'm just worried about the pictures, because that's what you should be worried about when you're buying a lens, right? Is the pictures. Mm -hmm. So, I'm not, I purposely not looking at diagrams, MTF charts, or anything ahead of time. I don't want to bias myself. I don't even look at the which lens is which when I'm looking at the images. I'm just looking at the images in their own right. He flips through really fast, too. Yes, Because yes. it's like, do 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 So I'm like, wait, which no, one's better? No, 50 again? Apo, corner to corner sharpness, consistency across the frame, chromatic aberration, yeah. vignetting, vignetting control, distortion control. I mean, it's second But what we're talking about here yes. is 
color aberration control. So yes. on a 50 Sumalux, have you seen any kind of chromatic aberration, purple fringing, wide open? Not as much as the Noctilux, but yeah. more than the 50 Apo. Right. So it's not in between, yeah. Somewhere in between. I also don't worry about that too much because it's so easy to correct with a single click in Lightroom. So it really it's is. It's like less of a concern than it used to be to me. Yeah, oh man. Uh, back in the early days of digital, chromatic aberration was just a killer. Now it's like, so? Yeah, there we go. All right, um, okay. So some observant person uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> said. Uh-oh. Yep, where is it? I saw it. It was in here. <laughs> they, know, they noticed something special on oh, the table. Oh, yeah, something special on the table. Well, Jose, yes. there's a question that I think Jose has for oh. us that relates to that. Daryl says, OMG, there's a red lens there. Yeah, so if you've, watched, if you've watched any of our previous episodes, you know that David and I love to gather up really, really cool um, special editions and unique products um, from the Leica portfolio. So this is a good opportunity to talk about a few, just to geek out a little bit. So what David is holding is the Leica 50 millimeter Apple Sumacron Aspheric Red Anodized. They made 100 of these for the world. It is one of the most striking, unique products that Leica has made, I say ever. When you buy them new, or when you could buy them new, they came with a red anodized brass front and rear cap to match. As you can see, David's got them on there now. This thing is insane. They have skyrocketed in price. They have been very hard to come by. This one is not for sale, unless you are gonna pay me a million dollars. That's stunning. I mean, it's just amazing. But that's not the only special edition we have. That's just the most dramatic. Um, there's also- This might be one of the most rare that we have, for sure. Oh, that is the, the rarest, yeah. I think so, yeah, of all the ones we've got. How many of these did they make, Josh? They made 100. Yeah. Yeah, so insane. Uh, there's also- well, there's, a, there's a funny story behind this lens. Yes. Not this exact lens. Yeah. The, the funny story is, I saw one of those when there was just one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I was at Photokina in, I want to say 2014, and I was in the, the press area at, at the Leica booth, and I'm at one little table having a conversation and I, and I glance over just like a little past where Josh would be. And there's Dr. Kaufman, the owner of Leica, chairman of the supervisory board. Yes. And I'm like, what, what is that that he's got there? <laughs> First of all, he had a white M240 mm -hmm. with like crazy black, you know, leather on it. And it had a red 50 Apo Sumacron on it. So they prototyped it for him. Decided for his worth, birthday. They decided it was worth production. Yep. And they put it in production for a short amount of time. I mean, they sold out instantly. Uh, we've also got, um, Jose, you want to like gravitate towards me here a little bit? Another easier to get and more affordable uh, special edition 50, <laughs> sure. which is the 50 Sumacron version 5 Safari edition, which is like this really cool, it is cool. matte olive green finish. This amazing. This looks cool on the Safari M10P or 240 or even a silver camera depending on your preference. So anyway, that's a Safari. We've also got a 50 Sumacron version oh. 5 Yahar, or Yare, Yare. Yare. I can't do German, so sorry. Um, this was to commemorate the 50th, 50th anniversary of the original Sumacron. So this is a version 5 that looks like a version 2. Brass, silver chrome. Thank you, Michelle, for letting me borrow this. Super <laughs> nice. I've actually never seen one before in person until I got my hands on this one. Uh, and then the real, the other piece de resistance on the table today is, here we go, 50 Apple Sumacron Silver Chrome LHSA. This was limited to 200 pieces. This is number 15 out of 200. Solid brass, so it's very heavy, removable brass lens shade. They made this lens in black paint and silver chrome. This is one in silver chrome, so one of 200. And this is a 50 Apple, so similar to the red lens, except this is in silver chrome. Um, amazing, 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 amazing piece. Um, the cool special this is I've got floating around. Oh, of course, the obvious one, uh, one that you can actually still get if you're industrious enough. This is the M10P mm. White Edition. So you'll notice it has a red dot. This is the only P edition of a digital camera like I made that actually retained its red dot. It is white painted top and bottom plates, white leather, White buttons on the back. Silver, silver buttons, Or white, sorry, the white surround. Silver buttons with the white um, LCD surround. Silver switches and dials, and a really, really cool silver chrome 50 lux with white lettering Oof. and a white focus tab. 
They made the M9P white edition, which was a Japanese uh, Japanese only um, special edition that came with the Noctilux in silver chrome. And they made the M8.2 or excuse me, the M8 yeah. white edition before that with a um, 28 Elmerit. Now this is an M10P white edition. This thing is stunning. Um, I happen to be a huge fan of the white edition cameras. I just think they look like nothing else. And of course, the real and I will keep the close up, Jose. Actually, the real question is how does the red Apo look on the white camera? I'm just gonna want to have want to eat candy canes after this. But see here, look at that. Oh, look at that. So this is the M10P white edition with the 50 Apo Summicron red anodized mounted onto it. It's like Christmas in August. Looks amazing. <laughs> it's just incredible. So, you know, you can have a lot of fun as we do with these really crazy special editions. Um, some of them are relatively simple to get. Some of them are a little harder to get. Just depends on, you know, your budget and what you're looking for cosmetically. But the white edition is cool because it is an M10P that has a red dot. So just something a little bit different. Um, that's enough. <laughs> Geeking out for now. Let's actually answer questions that people are asking. Go. Uh, Daryl has a follow-up question. He's the one who noticed it. He says the red anodized rear cap is available for five hundred dollars from eBay. I'll sell you one for fifty dollars with a can of red spray paint. How's that? <laughs> um, look, the reality is that if there's only a hundred lenses, there's probably only a hundred back caps, maybe a couple of spares. So, yeah, I mean, it's only worth what someone's willing to pay. And if you lost yours on a lens this valuable, don't lose it. Yeah, please don't lose it. If you if you use this lens in the field, just replace. These caps with the standard ones. Oh my gosh, yes. Put them in the box. Yeah, yeah. Not that you should be using this lens in the field, but look, you know, you're right to do so. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, here's a great question from uh, David, David, I don't know. David with an E? David. Da David, I guess. Sorry, David. we can't pronounce anyone's um, name. Hi, in, what in your opinion is the best M 50 millimeter lens to couple with the SL? Uh, David, what's your snarky answer to this question? My snarky answer? Yes. yes. I, no, he asked M. He's, that does say M, well, but if the best yeah. 50 millimeter lens to pair with an SL, especially an SL2, is an Apo 50 millimeter. Well, what does the best mean? Right? Oh, that. Well, I mean, I don't mean to be I know, know, that guy, I know. but the reality is that we get this question a lot, and I understand why people ask, and it's a valid question, but best for what? If we're just talking about sharpness, yeah, mm -hmm. the 50 Apos, it's, it's really the same rules apply as they would on an M10 Monaco or anything mm -hmm. else. The best for that Noctilux look is gonna be the Noctilux. Right. The best, the smallest and lightest lens, Sumo to Sumacron. So it really depends on your definition of best, what your objectives are. If your objective is quality, quality nothing else, yep. well, you should get a 50 Apo SL, which is even better than the 50 Apo M, but that's just that's the snarky a, answer. a discussion for another day. <laughs> yeah, this, um, the snarky answer is, yeah, the 50 Apo It's like four grand SL. cheaper, and it has autofocus, and it's better than the 50 Apo. Yep. So. It's a but lot bigger. It is a lot bigger. So the 50 Apo M is able to achieve 95% of the quality of the Apo SL in a size that's a fraction, fraction of the size and weight. So, yeah. but no autofocus, no weather sealing. Right. Um, okay, so let's say if I'm answering the question, the best 50 millimeter M lens on an SL for me is the 50 Apo Sumacron M. You're pointing to a regular Apple or a regular Sumacron. <laughs> it's Sorry, right here. Uh, it's right there. It's on the it's on the M10. Um, ah, yeah, this one. Yeah, there you go. Okay, for me, this is going to be, and I'll, you know what? I'll throw it on the SL for you. Just, just throw it on there. Give me that Lux. There you go. There we go. Okay. Sweet. We close up. Close up action. Close up. There we go. <laughs> Thank you. Jose. Yeah, it's super tiny. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's a nice Re little setup you got. Nice little setup. It's really easy to focus. I have used this, and in fact, if you've seen any of my my testing where I compare M's versus SLs, this is the lens I use because it's one of the best M lenses available. It works on all the cameras, and the lens doesn't become the limiting factor in the test. And you know what? I don't care about the magic when I'm doing the testing. I'm shooting it at f8. Yeah. So it's the the best M lens at the most optimum aperture, yeah, yeah, done. Um, so for me, I would choose this. But also, full disclosure, for many years, I've kind of gone through the the 50 millimeter project uh, progression myself. Uh, back in the film days, I shot a 50 f2 version 5 on a uh, M7 or an MP. 
Moving on to the digital era, I moved to the 50 Sumalux about, say, a year or two after it was introduced. The, and I said, the, the Aspheric. The Aspheric. Yeah, 50 Sumalux yeah. Aspheric. Yeah. So I went from the, the classic Cron to the Lux. I used that for a number of years. I used that on my M8, M8.2, M9, M240. And then when I had the opportunity to try the 50 Apo mm. on the original monochrome. That was in Berlin, right? It was in, well, after Berlin, it was actually in Wetzlar. Was it in Wetzlar? Okay, I can't remember. And I hold the very special honor of being very one of the very first people to shoot with the 50 Apo and the monochrome while walking around a German town with Peter Karba. <laughs> That's awesome. I swear. That's so cool. Um, and he said, and I quote, every time I went to stop down to test things, he's like, <laughs> he's like, what are you doing? Wait, no, no, you should be shooting wide open. <laughs> you every don't stop your lenses down in front of Peter Karba. Never, That's like a big no-no. He doesn't believe it's, in stopping he down. He doesn't approve. So it was actually kind of a cool experience, uh, very meta, right? To be shooting with the pinnacle of 50 millimeter M lenses, design, like shooting with the guy who designed it, yeah. who is the biggest fan of 50 millimeter lenses you'll ever meet. Yeah, yeah. He studies 50 millimeters, it's amazing. Um, so after that life-changing experience, and of course seeing how well it performed on the monochrome, which was a whole level, another level of performance, I'm like, I gotta have this. And I, I switched from the Sumalux to the 50 Apo, and I gave up that stop, and I gave up some of that magic, and I haven't looked back. Yeah. That's been my 50 yeah. ever since. Yeah, so. it's, I'll tell you, it's used a lot. <laughs> I just added CLA'd because it was just, uh, this one here actually just got mm. back from customer care, because David is, uh, what's amazing is he used it so hard, and it really it was fine. I just wanted to get a little bit tightened up. There, and I'll, I'll show it on an M. Just, there we go. There, oh, is this, oh yeah. That's an M10 mono, right? This is an yeah, M10 mono. that combo right there. Mm. That's sick. And this lens comes in silver as well. Um, I don't have one here to show you, unfortunately, but it's it's uh, it's an aluminum uh, aluminum barrel, so the same weight. So if you've got a silver M10 or M10P or M10R coming, um, I mean, it's just, and silver it's just such a nice balance. Yeah, that's sweet. And and to answer all of those questions of what is the I know this the best <laughs> if you want the most technically perfect sharpest, best performing lens for universal applications in small size at a reasonable aperture that can give you a variety of looks, this is it. And it's gonna perform excellently on an M10 monochrome, an M10R, an SL2, or equally well on a MP, you know, or, or a M10P, where the lens still really shines. I mean, even on the, the 246 monochrome, remember mm -hmm, those mm -hmm. huge prints we oh, made? Oh, yeah, of course, yeah. And the detail resolution, even at 24 megapixels with this lens. Yeah, it's mind-blowing. Like, you could just dive into the print. Yeah. It's amazing. All right, I think we've talked about that enough. So, what else? What, we got anything else in the comments, David? Or Jose, sure, you want to ask this question? Sure. Well, let's, let's defer to Jose so we can, you know, be useful. Oh, uh, this, oh is, this is a simple question Sorry, for Jose, you. I guess not. Sorry, I'm going to jump in and then I'm going to leave it. I'm going to send it back to Jose. Um, okay. You say this actually in a lot of episodes, mm -hmm. but maybe everyone doesn't understand what it is. Mm -hmm. What is a CLA? Oh, sure. CLA is a uh, mid-size uh, Mercedes. Um, <laughs> it's got a, no, it is actually. That stands the, for the GLE. That stands for clean, <laughs> lubricate, and adjust. It's just a blanket term for a service to factory tolerances. So, anytime you see a, something that has a, a CLA, that just means it was sent to either customer care or someone like DAG or YYE. They went through it, calibrated it, cleaned it, lubricated it, got it just the way it was out of the factory, so it was working perfectly. Uh, kind of like, imagine imagine a mechanic shop where they take apart and rebuild an engine and they, they polish all the parts and lubricate it and put it back together and tune it. That's kind of what's happening here. They're gonna disassemble it, they're gonna clean everything inside, lubricate fresh, yeah. clean out any gunk or dust, yeah. and then put it back together and make sure it's calibrated right. That's what a CLA is. Yeah. And my follow-up question is, mm. When do you know you need a CLA? That is a question I get a lot. If someone says, do I need to have this service? And mm -hmm. I say, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. The short answer is that. The long answer is, there's no regular maintenance required. It's not like a car, okay, 10,000 miles, gotta get an oil change. If you start to notice the lens focus is a little bit tight or a little sticky, or the aperture is getting a bit loose, or your pictures are out of focus because the calibration is off, that's when it's time for a CLA. But for you don't need to just have it done arbitrarily. Um, all you're doing at that point is giving up your gear for some amount of time and spending money you don't need to spend. You wait until you need to have it serviced. There's something that needs to be addressed and then um, 
get it done. So let me ask yeah, go ahead. this question here from Ed. Okay, 50 APO or 28 LUX for M10 monochrome? Well, hmm. if you want a 50 millimeter, I'd suggest the 50. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, they're, look, the serious answer is those are both excellent lenses. Some yeah. of like is best. Yeah. Uh, the 28 LUX is probably, I mean, you can watch our wide angle episode. We talked about it in depth. Mm -hmm. It is one of the finest wide angle lenses they've made mm -hmm. to date because not only is it fast, but it's also, I would say the 28 LUX is higher performing, almost significantly higher performing than the 21 and the 24 Sumalux. Oh yeah. Um, and better even than the 28 Sumacron or the 28 Elmerit. It is the best 28 millimeter they have ever made. And it's fast. Yeah. The two things are not related. Yeah. The 50 Apple though, uh, I don't know. Yeah. I'd say both. Because they, they're so different. Yeah. You know, you're going to get such a different look. You're going to get, I mean, even the frame line situation is different. The, co the compression is different. The depth of field is different. The, the, the 28 Lux vignettes wide open. The 50 Apple does not because that's part of the lens's character in the 28. So I the, two, the pictures taken between those two lenses are going to be dramatically different. It's hard to use a 50 for snapshot street shooting. It's easy to use a 28. It's hard to use a 28 for portraits. So it's easy to use a 50. What are you laughing at over there? <laughs> My kind of comment. Uh, Danny says, you need a CLA when you drop it and when uh, you drop it when you forget it's on your lap when you get out of the car. Well, Dan, you can't be trusting with anything nice. You don't, I, you just, I know you and I know exactly why. I'm not going to say on air why you can't be trusting with nice things, but um, thank, you for, thank you for tuning in. Um, this is why you can't have nice things. This is why you can't yeah. have nice things, yes. Okay, so... Jose, let's, let's kick it to Jose. Oh, yeah, right. I guess Jose can actually do something. I'm here, yes. I was drink, <laughs> drinking a beer. There. All right. Comments on quality improvement from 50 millimeter F1 Noctilux to 0.95 Noctilux. Okay, yeah, we, you said we we're going to talk about that. All so, right, Josh, yeah. I'm going to let you handle it, and I'm going to okay. do the show and tell, so you guys, you can talk about it if you like, or you can handle it. Uh, well, so, okay, so the first Noctilux was the F1.2. That's a lens I was not able to get. I'm sorry. I tried. Um, just uh, imagine it. Just just pretend that it's sitting here. So that has... It's, it's back here. Uh, spherical elements, super exotic, super rare, super expensive. Couldn't get one. What, year, what year was that? Uh, I don't even 1966? know off the top of my head. I have to look at my notes. I'm cheating. Nice. 66 to 75. A 48 millimeter filter size, super cool, super rare, but so rare that it's not practical for me to talk about to people that are actually using this stuff right now, right? So then we get into the F1. Simpler design, no spherical elements. First one was introduced in 1976. So they made it from 76 to like 2000 and something, 2008. <laughs> no, I should know this stuff. Um, four versions. The, the first version was an E58 with a removable hood, meaning which E58 filter size. we don't have here. No, I only have this this one here, which we'll get to. Uh, the second two were E60 filter size with the removable hoods. The one that we have here to show you is a version four, last version with a retractable lens hood and the 60 millimeter And something size. else. And it is factory six bit coded, which this is, uh, thank you Michelle for letting us this. This is one of the newest copies of this lens I've ever seen. Yeah, so um, if you look up here. Factory six bit coded out of the box, which is amazing. So. The F1 Noctilux has more vignetting by a large margin than any other 50 millimeter, 50 millimeter lens on this table that I've tested. Like significantly. The older ones, the newer ones. So if you want that look, get an F1. It is soft at the center and really soft in the corners. It is just like dreamy. It's got tons of chromatic aberration. It's a blast, but it will get old fast. And if you're not using it on an SL2, or with a Visa Flex, you're just. You I would know, also yeah, say that struggling. I think the F1 really shines in black and white. Mm, yes, because why? that's what it was designed for. Tell us why. So Dr. Mandler designed the F1 Noctilux, and purposely. I don't know. A lot of this is like what. Which story would you like to believe? <laughs> so here's the one that I'll tell you, and you can choose to believe it or not. Dr. Mandler designed the lens purposely with a shift in the blue channel. So if you imagine three colors of light, red, green, and blue coming through the lens, and just like quick little tech tip, when you have an, a lens like the 50 millimeter APO, it's apochromatically corrected, which means all three of those light rays hit the same point, which results in better sharpness. It results in no fringing or you know purple fringing, which is what happens when the red is out, uh, red and blue actually. So this 
had a uncorrected blue channel, which was so far out of alignment of red and green that on black and white, because blue isn't really picked up very much in black and white film, what it manifested as is just this really interesting kind of ambiguous glow, right? Mm. Everything was crisp and sharp and detailed, but then everything was kind of glowy also. Mm. So it was sort of purpose built for that. And again, you can choose to believe this or not. You can refute me. This is it's fine. This we're is having, what we're I, having a good time. This is the lore that I have been fed yeah. by my friends at Leica. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm saying on color, you're going to get these blue yeah. stuff, and it's not easy. It's not as easy to correct yeah. in Lightroom as straight up chromatic aberration, where you just click the purple and you know, you're done. It's a it's a fun lens to use, but it's not a great lens to use. And I don't mean that in a negative way. I just mean that objectively, everyone's always asking me about the best this, the best mm -hmm. that justifiably so in the world of Leica. It's just very soft and vignettes a lot. But for portrait work, for pictures of my adorable dog, stuff like that. It's kind of magical. Yeah, where you can put the subject in the center and then it just falls off and it's just like, it's crazy. Um, the point ninety five has much, much less vignetting. Yes. It's much, much sharper. It's much more usable. It has a much better hood design, much better bowel design, much smoother focusing. It's also much larger. I would it like you to much larger, talk yes. about the size, yeah. the physical dimensions on that. Yeah, we're, we're at uh, six hundred and thirty grams for a version four f one versus seven hundred grams for a version well for an f for a point ninety five. So yeah. a little bit heavier, but Trying definitely to get bigger. The, there we go. Sturdier and easier to use though. Just more modern, and they're all six bit coded, of course, which is nice. Um, you know, I could argue for having both because they're both so different. I mean, really dramatically different. White, I got, I got to have a little pun here. Ready? Oh no! What is your pun? Only if you have knocked the lust. Oh my god! Sorry, I'd say <laughs> you're you're fired. You're I'm done. done. I'm done. I'm <laughs> out of here. See ya. Okay. Um, <laughs> so the F1 has also proven to be a pretty good investment. Uh, don't forget the cap. I don't want Michelle to get mad at me. Uh, <laughs> pretty, they've they've gone up steadily in value over the years, especially the very late model ones or the. Uh, last 100 ones that came in this beautiful wooden humidor. Mm. Um, they're fun. They're fun and they're different and they're big and they're chunky. On an SL or an SL2, they're a blast with that EVF. You dial it in real precise. Uh, the point ninety five is just a lot more usable. You could top it down to F4 and it's actually almost as sharp as a 50 Lux Aspheric, whereas the Noctilux, even at 5.6, is not sharp at the edges. Sorry, it's not. Like There's no aperture where the F1 Noctilux is as sharp as anything modern. I tried right. it. <laughs> it doesn't. It's not. So, I think it would go back, look, I, I'm going to go back to my suggestion, or your suggestion, which is also my suggestion, which is if you're looking for that kind of cool look, but in a usable fashion, my recommendation is the 50 Sumalux. Yeah, the, the F1 Octolux is so um, unique <laughs> and soft that it's not better or worse to use it on even the best digital camera or the oldest film camera because it's like, it's past, it's like beyond that point. Right. Just think of it as a vintage lens. Like it's... I got, although I gotta say, listen, if you have like an M3 or an M6 with an Octolux on it, an F1, and some Tri-X, and you go out at night, it's gonna be pretty awesome. Yeah, it's it's one of the most That's fun. That's what it's made for. Right, it's one of the most fun lenses you can use. Like, don't get me wrong, I love using the F1. Whenever we get one on trade-in, the first thing I do is I take it out and I shoot around with it. Mm. Uh, because it's so much fun to play with. But I wouldn't have it if I only 50. I would not do that. I'd have even a regular Cron. Yeah. Version 5 is gonna be better in terms of sharpness. It's just a different lens for a different purpose. Kind of like the fan bar. Yeah, in exactly. It's a 90 fan bar. It's um, a look lens. Yeah, it really is a look lens. I agree with that. So, next question. What uh, what's this? What's this? Yeah, oh, sure. That's a great, that's a great question. I talked about a little, about you a little bit read of the show. Though. Um, you want me to read, read it for you? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Johnny, thanks for the super chat there. Uh, can you please explain the exact differences between the regular 50 Summa Lux, yes. spheric yes. and the black chrome version? Is it just cosmetic? Same question for the 50 APO. So, Gosh. 50 Sumalux black, which is here. And you got the black chrome over there. 50 Sumalux black chrome. Let's get a close up, Jose, and I will show you what we're talking about here. Um, so, optically, they are the same lens. No differences optically between the 51.4 aspheric black, 51.4 aspheric black chrome. So, let's get that out of the way first. Same optics. But, big difference in barrel construction. 51.4 black is aluminum. 51.4 is spheric, black chrome, brass. The weight difference, I will tell you, 335 grams versus 460 grams. So it's 125 grams heavier for the black chrome. That's the first thing to be aware of. Second, black chrome, 
has an E43, that's a 43 millimeter filter thread size. 50 Sumo Lux Black and also Silver Chrome, 46 millimeter, E46. There's something really important you need to know about the Black Chrome 50 as well. Out of the box, you cannot have a 43 millimeter filter attached to the lens and the lens hood at the same time. It's just a design flaw, if you will. Because the lens hood kind of clips over the front edge of the lens like this, if you have a hood, or excuse me, if you have a filter attached to the lens, the hood doesn't have enough clearance to actually grab onto the little groove around the edge. So I tell it to everyone who buys this lens, like a customer care, can modify this lens hood to work with a filter. What they do, because again, you cannot have a filter and a hood on the 50 Sumo Lux Black Chrome. It's the only lens in the current lineup that is one or the other. Every other lens that Leica makes, you can have a filter and you can yeah, have the hood. The hood no inside diameter goes yeah. around the filter outer diameter. So what happens is Leica will take this filter, take the hood from you, from your Black Chrome 50, which is this nice brass Black Chrome hood. I don't know what they ex exactly what they do, but essentially they turn it into a 43 millimeter threaded hood. So currently it could, of course, this hood is one piece. When you get it back from Leica, it still looks like it's one piece, but it actually unscrews into three pieces. So the bottom section, let me get one more close up here, Jose. Um, the bottom section here that has the clips on it, unscrews. And that leaves you with just sort of the pedal shaped vented part. But of course, the this diameter here is too big to go around the lens. So what you get is almost like a step down ring. So it's a, it's a separate piece that actually doesn't, sorry, it doesn't go on the hood normally. It lives separate. You unscrew the clip on part and you, in its place, or excuse me, yeah, you, in its place, you screw in what effectively is a step down ring that allows this to become a 43 millimeter threaded hood. Because all filters, at least the ones that Leica makes, have another set of threads on them. So you thread the 43 millimeter filter into the lens, then you thread the hood into the filter's threads. So that is the workaround if you own the black chrome and you wanna be able to use a filter and a hood at the same time. I don't use a lot of filters, so in terms of like, not on a lens like this, so I don't think about it. And if I was gonna go out with the lens, I probably wouldn't bring this hood because it's quite large. It looks really cool. Um, yeah. So optically the same, black chrome is heavier. Black chrome is a 43 versus a 46 filter size. And the black chrome's removable hood will not work out of the box without modification with a filter. Quickly to answer the second part, 50 I, don't, I don't have to show you here. The black chrome 50 Apo is still an E39, but it does have a removable lens shade very much like the LHSA. So it's basically the same as this, but black chrome. Mm -hmm. So it's brass, so it's heavier, and it has a removable shade instead of a retractable shade. Those are the big differences. It, and of course so, it matches the monochrome. Yeah, the difference. short answer is optically, they are the same. The same. Yes. Different Whew. on the outside. That was a long answer, but Whew. Well, I, I had to made, say it. I had we, to say we it. We made it. It was on we my list. Um, There's a camera without a lens on it. Oh, here we go. Uh, I got it. What's next? Uh, I see some stuff here, but maybe Jose, you got anything uh, lined up there? Sure, we are. We have still have a few questions. Um, you mentioned that lenses made pre two thousand and nine are not as highly calibrated from digital sensors. Would you include the Noctilux uh, F point ninety five with that? Uh, no, it was no because it was really designed in the digital era. Yeah. Uh, if you imagine when that lens was introduced, it was in uh, two thousand seven, I believe. 2006, 2007? Uh, 95 or was 2008. 08, 08. 2008. So that was post-digital. That was actually around the transition time when they went to new calibration procedures and new manufacturing. So no, I would consider the, the Noctilux actually one of the, one of the first of the modern calibration standards. So yeah. you're good. Yeah, and like it can even, if you send them your camera and your Noctilux, they can pair them together. So it can be super accurate. Yeah. Um, the reality is if I'm using a Noctilux, I'm using Live View, either with a VisaFlex or on an SL or an SL2. I'm really not relying on the rangefinder because it's, it's just splitting hairs. It's so close. But you can do it. It just requires a lot of patience. And practice. Practice. Practice makes not as bad. Yeah. What, if, what else you got? Right. Is it advisable to use a protection filter on Noctilux and Sumilux lenses, and does it affect their optical performance? Uh, sometimes. <laughs> and sometimes. Uh -huh. So that's kind of a loaded question, and people ask that a lot, actually. Yeah, well, uh, why don't you answer it for me? So the, the short answer is a lot of the newer lenses have much harder 
optical coatings on them, anti-reflectant coatings. They're, they're pretty durable. And in, flat, in fact, on, let's say, on SL and S lenses, they're all something called Aquadura, which is a really hard coating that's water repellent. It's hydrophobic. Uh, it's, those really don't need filters, you know, for protection against moisture and light dust and things like that. Now, let's say I was an embedded war photographer in, you know, a combat zone. Yeah, of course I'm going to put a protecting filter on my lens because, you know, sand, dust, dirt, debris, you know, just expose the elements all the time. So that's why I say sometimes. It depends. If you're just going, you know, down the block, no, I don't think you need it. Um, a lot of the M lenses have really nice shades now, uh, either retractable like this, you know, that do protect the lens a bit. Um, this one's a locking one, you know, and that does at least afford the, oh, I bumped into something and I don't want to hurt my front element. Yeah. So I'd much rather use a mechanical barrier like this than have a piece of glass there. Because to answer the second part of the question, sometimes, under most circumstances with a high quality protecting filter, let's say from B&W, Leica, Breakthrough, Heliopan, they're they're optical glass with multi-coating on them for, you know, to keep the reflections down and all that. But at the end of the day, it is another piece of glass that you're shooting through. And in some cases, depending on the geometry of the lens, the flatter the front element is uh, and more parallel to the filter, light can get in here and bounce around under, we'll call it the wrong circumstances. Mm. So like, uh, for instance, uh, the, the 70 millimeter S lens is completely flat in the front, has no curvature whatsoever because it's actually a protecting lens. It's not a piece of optical glass. I mean, it is optical glass, but not a... It's not part of the lens. It's not part of the lens path. Yeah. There you optical go. path. Yeah. And if you put a filter on there, it actually can be very detrimental because very often light will bounce around in there and cause flare. So we don't recommend that. But most of these lenses have normal field cur nor normal curvature to the front element. In most cases, you're not going to have a problem. I know a lot of people on a Noctilux, it's a very expensive lens. It's a really big front element. I know a lot of people are just more comfortable with a protecting filter. And that's okay. Yeah. And the reality is, I'd say in 90-something percent of situations, with a good quality filter, you won't have any decrease in quality. I'm going to... Um... Anybody who can guess in the comments, because I know the answer to this, how much it costs to replace the front element of, an, of a 0.95 Noctilux? I just had this done. Mm. Um, if you can guess, if you get it right, I will send you a Leica lens cloth if you're in, if you're in the United <laughs> States. So I'll check later. Uh, so the question is, how much does it cost to replace? This is a rough, rough because it spends on a few things, but give me a, a range and I'll... You got five minutes. Yeah. And then, then, we're gonna t then Josh is going to actually you. I'll send you a Leica lens cloth. Um, so... That being said, David, I'm going to follow up to that question. Yeah. Are there any filters, specifically with the Noctilux, that you consider essential? And knowing the Why, answer to that yes, question, I, do. I will hand you one of those essential Thank filters. Thank you very much, Josh. That we're talking about. Yeah, we were talking about this before. So, Here's very... The Here's the like one. Clear filter, that's personal choice. Yeah. But at a certain point, as I like to say, physics always wins. If you want to shoot a 0.95 at 0.95 in this thing called daylight, you have a little bit of a physics problem, which is to say that on a, let's say an M10R goes to ISO 100. There's the dog. <laughs> well, it's, that, it's a little warm in the a, studio today, so he's- It's uh, a little warm. He's a little thirsty. Okay, so it goes to ISO 100 at its lowest ISO setting. 0.95 is very fast aperture. You are going to run out of shutter speed because the fastest shutter speed on the M10R is one four thousandth of a second. If you want to shoot, pictures that aren't bright white and actually have some information in them, you're going to need something called... Oh, I have one right here. Aha! A neutral density filter. And this one looks... That's just a black disc. What are you talking kind about? Kind of strong. This one is... <laughs> That's oh, a Leica filter. This is a Leica one. Okay. Four stops. So six, it says 16x on the side, which is a four-stop filter. This might be slightly stronger than I'd recommend. Mm. I, I generally like to go for a three-stop. I think on original monochrome, I would use that. Well, now, right, so it depends. Yeah. On an M10R that goes to 100, this might be a little strong. If you're shooting on an M Type 246 monochrome, the base ISO of that camera is ISO 320, 
which is almost two stops faster than an M10R. And yeah, you are going to need a four stop ND if you want to shoot wide open. Yeah. And it sure. depends on your subject matter. So if you're photographing a bride wearing a white dress on the beach, Ooh, yeah. four stops it may not even be enough <laughs> if you want to shoot wide open. So you do have to keep that in mind uh, if you're using an M. But David, what if I have the Noctilux on an SL2? Do I need to worry about that? Funny you should ask. Mm, how convenient. No, you don't. And why so, is that? So you don't need an ND filter if you're shooting a fast lens on an SL, an SL2, a TL2, or a CL. Yes. Because all of those cameras have something the M does not, which is an electronic shutter. Mm. Now, all of those cameras that I named have slightly different fastest shutter speed specs, but suffice it to say, plenty fast to shoot 0.95 wide open at base ISO or even a little faster because I think you can go to 40 thousandth of a second on the yeah. SL2. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's crazy. So one forty thousandth of a second is uh, fast. It's fast enough. You're not going to need an ND for that. So. You don't need an ND. Yeah. Um, so unless the only reason then for an ND on an SL2 isn't for shooting as fast as you can, is actually shooting slower. So if you're looking to shoot, say, a waterfall or something like that, uh, this is the only thing that's going to be able to slow your shutter speed down. Let's, I'm going to talk about this for a second, but I, first I want to see the comments to see if anybody got close. Oh my gosh, there's, there's a lot, a lot of guesses. Scroll up, scroll up, scroll up. Oh my goodness, everybody's going crazy. Here we go. No, 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 <laughs> no. Keep going. No. Oop. Yep, he's close, but I'm not going to say who that is yet. No, 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 no. So far... Uh, you guys are... All over the place. Oh my gosh. Some man. of you really think it. First of all, how would it be more than the cost of Right. Money? Who thinks it's nine thousand dollars? So the person who wants scroll up, scroll up to the eight. Uh, I'm not gonna be able to pronounce this name. El Albert Fleek, if I pronounce your name wrong, I'm sorry. You said eight hundred dollars. You were the closest. That's about what it costs to eight hundred to a thousand, depending ding, on ding, 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 ding. what other work they have to do. Um, I'm sure someone like customer care is watching this and going, "Well, no, like, tomorrow no. is going to be two thousand. <laughs> right, the last one I had done was so. It's actually my point being is it's actually less than you may think. Right. If you're in the U.S. or even if you're in North America, just Email us, info at likeastarmiami.com, and I'll send you a Leica lens class. Thank you. Yay, um, congratulations. But I want to take a four-second break and talk about something um, oh. related but unrelated. Sure. Because I really want to, it's really important to us, and I really want to mention it. So um, we've obviously, David and I have been doing, this is our 15th episode of Ooh. the, which is crazy, the Red Dot Forum uh, camera talk show, and we're really trying to expand um, our YouTube um, content and offerings and, and get more of every, everyone involved who doesn't live in Miami. So Community building for like Yes. So uh, this Thursday, excuse me, next Thursday, August 13th at 7 o'clock, we're hosting our first virtual Leica Lounge. The Leica Lounge is a series of lectures that we have at the store every month where we bring in an artist, photographer, not necessarily a Leica shooter, just a, a talented photographer whose work we like to come in and talk about their photography, their techniques, their projects experience, working on everything. How they became start. a photographer, why they work so, on. Yeah. Um, Nicosi Gomez, he's a, a Miami based photographer, young guy, mm -hmm. 25. Mm -hmm. um, so, 7 o'clock, August 13th, 7 o'clock p.m. It, it's it's going to be a Zoom. Yeah, um, I'm going to drop I'm going to drop a link yeah. in the description. But it's it's a Zoom session, not YouTube Live. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. which so is it'll great. Be which is great because you'll also be able to be interactive and all that. Yeah. So we'll put a link in the comments, and you can also see it on our website, uh, like a But you do have to register, right? Y yes. Yeah. 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 Um, I want to thank Ashlyn for putting that together. Mm -hmm. This is our first time doing um, a virtual like a lounge. We're excited because it's going to offer um, a, a wider audience yeah. that kind of photographic inspiration um, because the opportunity to listen to and engage with an artist who's out there doing cutting edge work, really cool conceptual photography. Um, I think it's gonna be really interesting. So August 13th, seven o'clock, Zoom, Nicosi Gomez, super cool. Please watch. That was it. <laughs> oh, so, okay, bad news. What? Hmm, so sad. Uh, Albert, the, uh, the would-be winner says- Oh, you're in the EU? Yeah. Next time you come to Miami, let, let us know. No, so, no, he should he should call up customer care in Germany the 50 and have Apple, them send you a. The fifty Apple Super Crown Red is for sale for nine hundred and fifty nine thousand two hundred sixty eight dollars. <laughs> I'm just saying it with a straight face. So if you want to write me a check, if you want to write Juliana Farkas a check for nine hundred fifty eight thousand two hundred sixty eight dollars, you can buy the fifty Apple Red. Short of that, you can't have it. <laughs> sorry, um, sorry, I'm just saying. But yeah, everything's for sale. I mean, not my dog, but everything else on this table is for sale at the right price. Even the lenses I don't own. 
Michelle, I'm sorry. Sorry, Gary. Uh, <laughs> anyway, I just wanted to mention that. It's really cool. Sad trombone. Sad trombone, yeah. So Jose is <laughs> going to do a cool pan Ooh. of all the goodies we've got uh, on the table here today. All right, and we're going to look... Uh, what else? I'm sure we have... Oh, I want to talk about, um, while you're looking for questions, a couple of cool um, accessory hacks that I like. This keeps coming up as well. Um, some of the ops in Rokranos? No, the... Oh, I don't know much about that to be honest with you. I never really. I always thought that was kind of like when the old, older than M mount. Um, but anyway, I want to talk about a cool accessory hack or a couple of them really quick. Um, if you have a silver chrome lens or a silver anodized lens like this silver 50 Oculus here. Oh my gosh, here, yeah. Nice. The standard um, Leica back cap, black plastic. Jose, we get close up here. Um, he's going there. Uh, looks like this is standard black plastic. Um, back cap, which really doesn't do justice when you put it on a silver lens like that. So one of the cool things that I've been able to get my hands on from Leica is actually a silver chrome brass rear M cap. This is what originally came with the 90 Thambar. It's not a part of the standard Leica product catalog. It is a part, but we do sell them. This looks, I mean, look at that. This is not an, an aftermarket. This is a Leica made. Okay, you got to remind me to Drop a, a link to that as well. Yeah, this, this thing is really cool. So if you have a silver chrome lens, like look how sweet. And it's brass, so it's heavy. It's got some heft to it. Um, these things are awesome. And they actually like get patinaed to wow. them. Like if you if your rear cap can get patinaed, I mean, how cool is that? And then with the Noctilux uh, in silver, you actually have the uh, matching silver chrome, uh, this is aluminum lens cap that comes with it. So now you're fully integrated silver chrome. Another cool Noctilux hack is depending on the age of your Noctilux, if you have a black one, you may have only gotten it with the 60 millimeter E60 clip-on cap, which is fine, but it's not very attractive. So one of the things that you can get now, which was a sort of recent addition to the Leica product portfolio, is, I actually have it here, I'm gonna crack it open. The Noctilux cap, similar to the silver one, it's actually a metal, it's Ooh. aluminum, not brass, so it's not heavy. The metal Noctilux cap, uh, in black that actually matches. Oh, that's nice. So the push-on caps was felt lined on the inside. So if you've got an Octolux, but you got it before they started including this with, with them, I think it was around 2016, would you want to have it? It's product code, I'll tell you, 14052. There it is. Yeah, right get a shot of the box. Uh, get a shot of the box. Nope. Closer. There we go. So that's one more cool thing. And the last cool thing I'm going to talk about when we're talking about cool accessories is, and I know some people are asking about the um, the Elmar. What's interesting about the 50 Elmar 2.8, the modern version, that, um, let me just put this cap away so I don't misplacing stuff, that's unique to that lens is it is, as far as I can think of, the only M lens to come with a standard threaded lens hood. There's lots of lenses that have threaded lens hoods, but the Elmar's lens hood actually threads into the filter threads. All of the other modern M lenses, the thread is separate from the filter thread for the hood. So you can have a filter and a hood simultaneously. But the 50 Elmar is unique. So what I'm the reason I'm mentioning this is because one of the cool things that I like to do is you can actually buy, let me get a little close up of this one, the 50 Elmar hood separately. It is one, two, five, five, zero. And you can use it, for example, as a threaded hood on a version four. So if you don't want to get one of those cheapo, after, so this is an aftermarket threaded lens shade, which looks cool, but it's not made by Leica. If you want to have an authentic Leica threaded lens shade, look at that. That's pretty nice. Yeah, so this is the only standard filter size threaded lens shade that Leica has made, at least in the modern era. I could put it on a 50 Simicron version three, like that. Uh, they made these in silver, although I don't think you can get them anymore. Um, so just kind of a cool accessory hack. So it was 12550 is the product code for the hood, and 14052 is the product code for the Noctilux cap, and the brass rear caps don't have a product code because they're not part of the standard catalog. But if you search, uh, I'm looking at anything, like brass rear cap on our website, we can put a link to it. I'll um, put a, up a link to Super cool. So I brought some of these cool goodies with me today. I just had to geek out a little bit. These aren't. Big things are just little things that are neat that you may not have just heard us having about. a good time. Yeah. Um, anyway, back to our regularly scheduled programming. Go okay. Ahead. Um, ooh, let's see. Uh, Can you talk about the fifty millimeter dual range lens? We promised we were going to. Did we promise that? We we okay. did. I did. I did. <laughs> you have can. to go along with it. Yeah. Whew. Okay. So 
We're just, I'm just putting myself back together here because I haven't there you go. taking everything there you apart. Go. Put this back on the um, yep. shabbity doobity. Here we go. Uh, okay. Fifth the Shavokan dual range. Here we go. It's this lens with the funky gizmos on it. So this lens came out at the same time as the 50 Summicron Rigid, so in the 1950s. And what this lens does is, with the use of these, what they call their goggles or the bug eyes or whatever, um, eyepiece. Yeah, hold on. Oh. I'll stream it again. Let's, let's see if it reconnects. Oh, boy. Hmm. Just think we're, we're back online. Just here we thought you've seen all the things that could go wrong. Hold on, hold on. Uh, there we go. Let's see where we, we ended up. Can you put it back on us? <laughs> Are we live again? Uh, I think we're about to be. Okay. So uh, I'm going to wait for it to catch up just to make sure that we're actually where we are here. Yeah. Let's see. Mm -hmm. I see you. I do see me. OK. Are we good? I don't know. Somebody, Maybe. somebody, somebody, text me and tell me that we're okay. Are we <laughs> we're okay? Back. Are we okay? <laughs> Julie, are we back? Okay. Oh, we're back. We okay, were we were so disgusted by these questions about what the best lens is. We just decided to quit <laughs> in the middle of the show. Sorry uh, about that. Listen. Wow, that's pretty good. Fifteen episodes. Fifteen episodes. And with, the first time without a streaming problem uh, like sorry. this. Sorry, everybody. Thank you for putting up with our technical difficulties. Uh, where was I? You were talking dual about range. the 50 dual range. So when you don't have the goggles attached, you have access to the lens's standard focus range from a meter to infinity. When you do have the goggles attached, you have access to the close focus range. Very simple. This lens, this is the important part, out of the box, meaning stock, cannot be used on a digital M without the risk of damaging the rangefinder mechanism. So you can actually have this modified. I know DAG camera can do that, where they take a circular saw and just mill off part of the close focus cam, what you gain is the ability to have access to the lens's full range on a digital M. What you lose is rangefinder coupling at the close focus range. So if you've got live view, VisaFlex, it's no big deal. Um, well, then you can use it like any other macro lens, yeah. which is not rangefinder coupled. Right, you just use it with live view. So mm -hmm. um, you can use this on a digital M. I, I've been able to mount it in the right combination of modes unmodified, but if you just turn it the wrong way, you can damage your rangefinder mechanism. So you don't want to do that. You want to send it to DAG if you're OK with having it permanently modified. You can't reverse it. These aren't so insanely expensive that that's a big deal, thankfully. Mm. Um, but they're great lenses. If you're shooting film, they're, they'll work just fine. They're really fun. Um, the ability to get to that really close range is cool. Plus, they look cool. They're brass. Yeah, they're nice. Uh, and they're very sharp. Not as sharp as a version 5, but not bad. pretty darn sharp for, uh, for a vintage lens. So hopefully that answered your question. Can we? Uh, Hopefully, are the comments back? Yeah. Uh, the comments are back. Do they get reset, or are they still? Uh, uh yes. Oh, sad. Any advice on street photography with a fifty millimeter? Um, be careful. No, <laughs> I, listen. Cartier Bresson was a fifty millimeter shooter, like the originator of street photography. So yeah, of course you can do it. But like Josh said, it's you know, if it's not, if it's not in front of you. And you don't really focus on composition, that you're going to make or break the photo. A 50 millimeter is honest, like Josh said. Uh, so yes, you can use it. It's going to be a little bit different perspective than say a 35 or a 28. Uh, it's more neutral perspective rather than more of that participant perspective, but it can work really well. Um, I know a lot of people use say 28 and 50 as, as a really good street combo because it's the problem is, if you go much longer than 50, then it starts being very voyeuristic, which can be good. But in this case, I think for general street photography, would you say like 2850 is a, a pretty nice combo yeah, for that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, because the reality is sometimes it's nice to have the look of a 50. Mm -hmm. I mean, because street photography isn't about a lens. It's about the pictures. So right. you have to know what your objective is creatively, photographically, and then use the tool that gets you there. So if you want pictures shot on the street that look like they were shot with a 28, Use a 28, so yeah. But it's sure, the control. I mean, I've done street shooting with a 75. I mean, you know, it depends on your mood. Uh, any good questions? Uh, lots of questions. Jose, you want to? Yeah. Okay. Of oh, the lenses that you have on the table there, which ones are made in Canada? Hmm. Um, this one? The F1 Octolux is. I don't know about the other ones. Uh, let's see. This one is German. I think these are pretty much all 
This one's Canadian, the version 4. Yep. Here we go, version 4 is Canadian. Um, I should have looked at this beforehand. Well, I can give the little, the kind of, why Canadian? These are all... So, yeah, these here's, are all a, here's a little uh, trick trivia, right? How many F1, 50 millimeter F1 knock deluxes are made in Germany? Zero. Well, Where? someone's probably going to say, well, there, there was there one was that they one, made, yeah. but no, they, they didn't. They're all made in Canada. Production? No, they didn't make any. The F1 knock deluxe was only ever made in Canada at Elcan, or Ernst Lights Canada, in Midland, Canada. And the head of optical design there, Dr. Walter Mandler, was legendary. It still is legendary as the inventor of the Noctilux, as well as, actually, the version 5 Summicron was actually the last Mandler design. So this was also designed in Canada by Dr. Mandler. Yeah, because that's a version based on a version 4, which was this blends right here made in Canada. Exactly. There you go. Um, he designed a lot of the best R lenses, a lot of the best M lenses. The 75 Sumalux was a Mandler design. So very well regarded. And Canada, for for a good amount of time, was kind of leading the way for Leica technology-wise yeah. at, at, you know, Ernst Light Canada. Yep. Yeah. Basically the Canadian division of Leica. It's yeah. not a different company. Um, I'm going to see the question at the very bottom there because I'm just I was thinking about this myself. No, go on. Luis? I think I'm really looking for a push on cap for the non black release in Yes, that's actually a good question because I was just thinking about this. Why don't you read it out loud? The question is Is there a push on cap like the one for the F1 or the 0.95 knockouts I showed versus a clip on cap for the 514 um, standard black? No, not yet. But for example, the M10P white, um, this does come with a push on cap for the silver. So they clearly exist. There's not a production one that I've been able to find. But stay tuned because if I do find one, Josh I will. Josh is really good at hunting these yes, things down. Yes, uh, yeah, yeah. So I, I, I'll put it in the comments. Like I'll make a comment at some point if I find one. So I just wanted to mention that because I'm on a similar quest. I do like the push on caps a lot. I think they're cool. Um, not practical because they, if you drop them, they dent. But <laughs> cool. What else we got? Can you address minimum focusing distances <laughs> between fifties? Um, sure, I have it all right here. So the all the noctiluxes are a meter. Everything else is 0.7 meters, except for the Sumerits. Those Oop. are 0.8 meters. Oop, hold on. What? Just hold on one second. We're uh, getting a little wonky here for some reason. Oh. Jose, why don't you check on that before we go? Stream is healthy. Yeah, it's not, though. Someone's saying it's getting laggy. Ah, that's just how I am in, in real life. Is that just, how you I'm are? I'm just very laggy sometimes. You're just super you know? choppy? Yeah. Oh, OK. They said back after we went. OK. It's free, people. What more do you want from us? <laughs> Once we start it, charging it's you, it's the YouTube man. Then, you, then it's it'll the be YouTube. better. I promise. Um, so, okay, the range is the, not including the dual range, which goes down to 0.4, uh, 0.48 meters in its close focus range. Mm -hmm. um, 0.7 meters is as close as you're going to get with any 50, um, or one meter if it's an older one or an Octolux. Right. That's the range. And the, the two Sumerites are 0.8 meters. The, the two four and the two five. So. And and I think the question is why uh, with close focus. Because generally, 0.7, I believe, is the minimum rangefinder calibrated distance. Yeah. That you can't go less than the minimum. And that's one of the advantages of using a native SL50, whether it's the 1.4 or the Apo uh, F2, mm -hmm. on an SL, as opposed to using a 50 Apo, let's say, M, because the SL lens is focused a lot closer because they're not beholden to having to be rangefinder calibrated. Um, so food for thought on that one as well. Mm -hmm. Wow, okay, technical difficulties aside, these are good. We got good questions coming in. It's, we're, we got time for more, so um, if, you requ if your comment got deleted, please put it in again and we will. Yeah, apologize for that. YouTube, get what you pay for, so true. <laughs> I'm making them money. That's, That's right. the crazy we're thing, right? We're having a good time. Yeah, okay. It's the weather, it's the weather. Yeah, it, we still have a hurricane kind of over that what way. What lens would go best with my gold Submariner? Um, the, gold, uh, <laughs> the gold 35 Supercron from the ASC. Edition. Ooh, yeah, we got we got to do a camera yeah. and watch a camera and watch pair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like that. Days. Is but, that like um, food and wine? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Cameras and wine. That'll be an episode later on. The, if anybody wants to see a camera and watch episode, please say so because oh, I'll totally. You had to it. ask for it. Totally, I have no shame. Uh, we'll just wait till they find out what we're doing next. That's going to be really fun. Um, okay. Um, so yes. Well, everybody keeps asking about the Elmar. They do. They do. So and we should give a safety tip on that too. Well, there are three collapsible fifties, and. Certainly, the two vintage ones, you do not want to mount them or collapse them on a digital M camera. So the question is, can you still use it? The answer is yes, just ex um, extended. Then the question is, how do I prevent damaging my sensor 
or my shutter, David is going to show you a little trick that we've talked about before and now we're going to show you yeah. how to prevent yourself from accidentally collapsing. This is a 50 Super Conversion 1 collapsible. How to prevent yourself from collapsing that by accident on a digital camera. So why don't you show So us? first I'm going to show what, when we talk about collapsible lenses, right? Yes. Okay, what does that actually mean? Well, collapsible means that after I unlock it, it pushes back behind the lens mount. Now, that's generally not a problem. It's not a problem here. But as I get to my close focus, you'll notice that that rear... I don't even know if I'm sharp. Let's try that again. <laughs> there you go. You can see that my rear element, now I've got the focus lock on. Yeah, it's a little fiddly. Well, there's another reason to get newer lenses. These older ones Okay, are so... The yeah, so right there, I'm collapsed, but I'm at infinity, and it's fine. But as I... This is really fiddly and small. Okay, <laughs> you had to hand me this one. Let's see. There we go. Okay. Uh, that Sorry, that's infinity. Ugh. And the infinity lock. Okay, but as we go back, you'll notice that the rear element is is protruding back a bit right there. Okay, now on, I think on this particular lens it's probably okay, but on on a lot of the collapsibles, why don't you show me this one that goes back yeah. further. Yeah. This okay. is a modern 11-831-51. Uh, now that one, you can see how much that goes back. A yeah. lot further. And, oh, this is a lot less fiddly. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> that's why I was going to hand you that one originally. Thank you. <laughs> so you'll see this is at infinity, uh, and that's at close focus. So here, you're not going to have any problems. But not everyone locks their lenses at, at infinity focus, and in the bag it could get, you know, the focus ring could move, and the worst thing to happen would be that hitting your shutter, because your shutter is very fragile. It's made of very sensitive, very ultra lightweight titanium composite blades, and uh, yeah, you don't want to bend them. Bending is very bad. So what do we do? We talked in previous episodes about, oh yeah, just stick a rubber band on there. And everyone is probably like, what for what? <laughs> so I brought a rubber band this time. A colorful one. A colorful one. So you can see if you want to be more stylish, you can make one in black. But I'm going to show you in bright green so you guys can see it. So let's pop back to the close-up here. There you go. Okay. So what we were doing while David's doing this is the objective is to be able to use this lens worry-free on any digital M camera without the concern of accidentally collapsing it while using it and causing damage to your shutter. Okay. And there we go. Look. Now I'm back to that safe distance, no matter where I focus. So even if I'm at, actually, I didn't do it one one enough here. Let's, okay, so no this pressure, is, David. No pressure. No pressure. But this is loose. So let's do it one more. There we go. Okay, now, now we've got a good fit. There we go. <laughs> it's hard to do this on camera. It really is because I'm trying to pay attention to the close-up camera. Yeah. Okay, now you'll notice that. It won't collapse into the body, and it doesn't matter at what focus point I do this. It's always at a safe distance uh, relative from the flange to the focal plane. And you don't have to have it in green. Like I said, if you want to find a black or silver band, you can. Yeah. So this is just a little trick to use this lens comfortably without worrying about damaging your shutter. But this lens, just to, to talk about this lens while David puts it back together, um, I'm going to The 50 Amar well. is interesting because it's a pretty modern lens. They made it from 94 to 2007. So they made it right up until the 6-bit digital era. It's not as good as a version 5 Summicron. <laughs> what? <laughs> Waiting for the rubber band, red edition, <laughs> type 401. That'll be $5,000. Um, so it's not as sharp as a version 5 Summicron. Thank you, sir. But it is a nice split between an older Summicron and the current Summicron while being having its own kind of character and has more contrast than a version 3 Summicron does. I don't know. I've never fallen in love with the LMR. I think it's because I'm spoiled by Summiluxes. But it's really, really small. It's got a unique rendering. And it's just a fun lens to use. It's not... I think it's only like 4 or 5 elements. It's not anything super exotic. Um, but it is sharp. I will say that. Especially when you start stopping it down, it is quite sharp. And on a modern M, where low light is not as major of a concern, 2.8 maximum aperture is not a big deal. No. It's um, a fun lens, too. Yeah. I'm, there's not a lot to say about it, in my opinion, just because it's not as exotic as a lot of these lenses we have here. But that's not putting it down. That actually means it's reliable, and it doesn't well, get in your way. I'll ask you a follow-up. So yes. what do you think about the, the 50 Elmar? Yes. Okay. Versus a 50 Summerit. I mean, they're both yeah. solid, small lenses. Sumerit's better. Sumerit's bigger. 
you know, the Elmar, the, thing, the reason you go with an Elmar is one, you think the collapsible design is cool, which it is. It's really, really small. Two, you just want something that's a little bit different. It just looks a little different. You want a 50 millimeter focal length. You want something small. You know, these are under $2,000. Um, I think they're even under 1500 depending mm -hmm. on if they're six-bit coated. Um, they're not hard to get, and they're fun. There's, the focus is pretty nice and smooth. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a little fiddly to get it locked, but you get used to that. Um, yeah, I, I don't I don't think that this lens is pretentious or clinical or overly anything. It's just nice. It's got a nice focus fall off. Not a ton of bokeh, but yeah, it's just a, just a solid performer. I'd still probably go with the Sumerate unless... I was looking for something a little bit lower contrast, a little bit more vintage looking. Because it's it kind of splits the difference between the Kron and the Sumer. It's like sits in the middle somewhere. No, oh, damn. Sure, what's next? If you like it, get it. Yeah. This is the official Red Dot Forum camera talk rubber band. <laughs> this will be hanging in the museum. Hold on, hold on. Uh, it. <laughs> Let's see. No, don't, 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 I don't want to lose it. Oh, what are you doing? Oh, we're never going to get that back. <laughs> oh, Jose! <laughs> we're never going to get that back. Oh, boy. All right, next question. We're having too much fun. What do we got? All right. We have a question from Art. This came through email. The very newest like a 50 millimeter lens, the 50 millimeter Summercron SL, stops down to f22. Why do none of the M series 50 millimeters stop down to f22? You know I got to take this question, right? Yes. I'm just looking at other questions that are coming in. So um, forgive me. Okay. So I'm just going to say it right now. I say this a bunch. If you've ever been on a workshop with me, I say this a lot. Friends. Don't let friends <laughs> shoot at f22. In fact, uh, friends don't let friends shoot at f16 on high resolution digital cameras. Uh, this is not a knock on the lenses. It's just as you get a higher resolution sensor, you have smaller and smaller pixels. And that means that you hit the diffraction point sooner as you stop down. It is sort of a trade-off. Do you want higher resolution but less possible depth of field? Because what happens after you pass the diffraction point on your lens, the images, you get more depth of field, but the images start getting softer. By f22, they can get pretty mushy. Um, I, I would not recommend it. Maybe on film it's okay, but when we're talking about you know 40 megapixels, even 24 megapixels, f22 is, it's just yeah. an aperture too far. If you need that much depth of field, Focus Stack. Yeah. Um, Helicon Focus is a program that I've um, not used much, but heard of good things. You're you're not getting your money's worth. Or frankly, when we talk about photographic tools, shoot wider. Like so, if you need more depth of field, yeah. I would shoot with a wider angle lens and yeah. crop. Right. A 35 at f16 is going to have more depth of field than a 50 at f16. Yes. So that's another good point. Yeah. Um, but please, just for me, for me, <laughs> for me. So or. I, Shoot with an SL2 or an S, and it has the depth of field scale on the top screen, yeah. and then you know you, you can just be super precise. And but Josh, M lenses have depth of field scales right here. They do, but it's about half of that on a high tolerance digital lens. Yeah. So. Uh, what else we got, Jose? Right. So many questions. What time is it? Almost nine. Okay. We started a bit earlier on a Sunday night, so hopefully, hopefully you appreciate that. Um, if if We'll see if the 7 o'clock time works for future episodes. Yeah. Well, yeah, you guys, before the show's over, comment. Do you like 7 o'clock or 8 o'clock Eastern time? Because we actually do want to know. And Saturday or Sunday, what do you guys prefer? Yeah. And the larger, the physically larger lenses that have larger aperture, um, aperture blades, <laughs> sorry, English, um, have the ability to go smaller. The really tiny lenses, I don't think they have the tolerance to go. Because if you look at... Yeah, there's not a lot um, of room in there, is there? Where's the fifty lux right here? It is at f sixteen. The hole is incredibly small, mm -hmm. and I imagine at a certain point you just can't. I'm not an engineer, but there's I'm logically assuming that there's engineering constraints um, to going past f sixteen. So you're just not going to get it on a tiny lens like that. Um, but it's just not what those lenses are made for anyway. Um, but the larger lenses, yeah, if they can put it on there, why not? Uh, uh, I am going to hit this question. Go and ask it. Yeah. Will's question. Yeah. yeah. Probably a silly question from Will. Not a silly question, actually. Mm, good question. What 50 would you use for astrophotography? David. I would consider two different lenses for mm. astrophotography, and I've experienced people shooting with both of these lenses for astrophotography. Uh, it's a depends question. Mm, um, we love those. Thank you. It depends if you can have a slightly longer shutter. With astrophotography, you can, as long as you stay under 15 seconds, you'll get 
kind of pinpoint stars. After 15 seconds, you start getting half moons because, you know, we live on a celestial body hurling around the sun and it's moving. Says some people, let's be real. Some, maybe, <laughs> yeah, it's, maybe it's flat. I don't keep, know. Keep going, keep going. Okay, so yeah, the rotation of the Earth and the stars aren't moving, the Earth is moving. Uh, and basically anything after 15 seconds, you can see that movement in the star trails, which is cool because if you do a really long one, like 16 minutes on an M10R, you can get cool star trails. Uh, but generally, so there I'd say it wouldn't matter. I would get the sharpest lens I could, which would be the 50 APO. If you're okay shooting, let's say eight to 10 second exposure, or you wanna do a multi-minute exposure for, for really cool star trails. Uh, pro tip, point at the North Star if you're in the Northern Hemisphere, and they'll all rotate around that. There you go. Uh, now, let's say you want to shoot Northern Lights, Aurora, um, Milky Way, where it might be a little dim. And actually, I'm going to go with the 0.95 Noctilux, because you can shoot it two stops faster and get a four-second exposure with the same amount of light intensity as a 16-second exposure. So two answers, depending on the style of astrophotography you're after. Good answer. What's next? Can you get a silver hood and a cap for the Sumilux 50? Well, the 50 Sumilux is spheric and silver has a built-in hood. So, well, you want to get a close-up on that while you're moving it. Um, so you wouldn't get... No, it's not, that's one of the nice right. features of the lens. Right, so it's, it has a built-in lens shade just like the black version does. Um, but you could use the rear cap. Where'd it go? Here it is. So I could put the brass rear cap on the 50 Lux. Look how good that looks. Mm. Fantastic. Wow. That is so nice. So yeah, wow. any silver chrome lens will work um, with the brass rear cap, at least as far as I've tested. Um, but this, because this lens has a integrated hood, you don't need to get um, another hood for it. So I'm, I'm not sure if that answers the question or maybe I just maybe need to be more specific. Feel free yeah. to elaborate. And, and follow up, There there is two Good points here. Uh, Bill says, if you use a tracking mount, star trailing is eliminated. Talking about astrophotography. Right, of course, yeah. And Andrew followed up at the same time. Don't most telescopes have motor drives for astrophotography to counteract? Yes. Uh, the answer is yes, but if they're not perfectly smooth for photographic applications, you could get kind of a zigzaggy look. Yeah. Uh, so the answer is it depends on the quality of your tracking mount, but yes, that is available. I am not a 100% an astrophotographer, but I sometimes like to take pictures of the stars and celestial objects in the sky when I'm doing general landscape, which I think most photographers fall into, so we're kind of answering it from the general photography standpoint. The answer, of course, is of course you're gonna get better results using specialized equipment. And I think really dedicated astrophotographers are also shooting at really low ISO with tracking mounts and stacking exposures. Yeah, it gets pretty intense. Yeah, and they're actually taking these partial exposures and then combining them in post-processing. Yeah. So kind of like an HDR, but for stars. Yeah. Um, that's kind of beyond my pay grade because <laughs> I just want to take pictures of cool stuff. <laughs> I just want to take pictures of cool cars. So here we are. What else we got, Jose? I have a couple of questions about comparing um, 50 millimeter and 75 millimeter for portraits. Okay. Well, we talked a lot about 75 in our um, telephoto lens mm -hmm. episode, so I definitely, for a more long form discussion on that. Check it out. We'll check it out. The short answer, I think, is... I mean, yeah. the reality is, more traditionally, the longer the focal length, the more pleasing it is for faces. But who decides what is more pleasing and what isn't? That's up to you. I, you know, I think if you're going to be doing, you know, full body, half body, and you don't have as much space to back up, you may be glad you had a 50 and not a 75. But I could argue for either. It just, it always depends on your creative objectives, for sure. Yeah, I mean, I, here, I'll just, I can show you two portraits off the top of my head that I have on okay. reviews. Okay, so pull up some stuff while we, while we go. Yep, so here, Jose, you want to go? Yeah, and it is important to mention that we have this crazy back catalog on Red Dot Forum of yep. stuff. And it's not just to read a review of this camera, it's to also to see sample images that David has done because he always tells you what he's shooting with. So let's uh, scroll, scroll. David is very wordy when it comes to these things. Uh, <laughs> thorough. I prefer thorough. 87,000 words later and... Oh my gosh. Okay. So I'm trying to find... I have a portrait here. 
Eventually, I swear I have a portrait. Here you go. <laughs> hey, there we go. Okay, this is a 50 Apo at, at 2.8. Oh, that's and a nice shot. I like, that. I like the way the background of his shirt tie together. That's, was that on purpose? <laughs> the answer would be, of course. Of course. Yes, I asked him to move. He was in the street, and I asked him to move off to the side. And I like the white you know, jacket there. Uh, so this is an M10 shot from my M10 review when I first took it out. Uh, and that's a 50 Apo. And I definitely wouldn't call that clinical. It's not a Noctilux. You know, when you look at the out-of-focus areas, yeah. it's not, you know, just completely see, matched. And this is a good opportunity. So I'm pointing like you can see what I'm pointing at. Um, you I'll see point. how the the way that the out-of-focus, um, the bokeh is, is consistent. Here. So if you look at from where it starts at the edge of his forehead to the ed edge of the frame, there's not a dramatic difference. It's very consistent. It's very uniform. That, very uniform. That is... A 50 Apo. A Noctilux, the fall off would be dramatic, both in terms of focus and luminance level, meaning getting darker in the corner. So that's a characteristic of the 50 Apo. Right. Um, We've got a lot of great stuff in here. I forgot about this. Went yeah, to New Orleans, I forgot about it too. I know. City. Look at all this. I was trying to see if there was another 50 shot. Yeah. Um, but go and read David's M10 review, if, or don't even bother to read it because, you know, it's really long, but it's good. Look at the images because <laughs> there's actually a lot of great M10 shots in there. You can see how some of these lenses work in real time. In yeah, real and then I want to show one other one, which is also from New Orleans, interestingly, mm -hmm. from my M246 uh, monochrome review. There we go. And I have some nice shots, because I, I really do think that the 50 Apo just blends perfectly with the, with the monochrome cameras. And I'm going to show you, I mean, that's, oh, here's an example. Like, again, because you don't have to worry about low light ability. Now, this is not a portrait, but it has that, you know, kind of, ah, sorry, just kind of perfection, I don't know, for lack of a better word, across the frame. It's even from the topmost corner to the bottommost corner, you know, in terms of, of, op of optical performance. Um, I mean, but yet, it still can have mood to it, right? So all that's created with, with light and composition. So this kind of feels, certainly I would not call this a clinical image, but it performed really well. And we're talking about flare with, say, the 50 version 5. Obviously, uh, the Apo Simicron does not have this issue at all. Yeah, and shooting, shooting into headlights. Directly into in the many rain. light sources. Yeah, with reflections, reflections everywhere. everywhere. Yeah. Right. OK, but the one I was looking to do, and that's another one. Here, I actually shot a lot with this lens on the monochrome. Um, and again, it's just you see kind of how the, the fall off of the lights is. Right, and, and the notice subject. there's bokeh here, but it's not how do I say this? It's Crazy. not part of the picture. It's not taking away from the subject. You're not looking at that going, wow, that bokeh or that focus fall off is wild and crazy and really right. unique. It just falls off, almost like you'd see with your eye, in a way, where it's it's part of the picture, but it's, it's on, not. It's, it's honest. It's oh, Yeah, there we go, that word again. So And that's and that's at 2.8. Uh, okay, okay, so let's here. Maybe so do one, one more, and then let's get yep, to a few more questions. So the one I'm right. looking uh, a little later was, yes, I have, well, actually, that one's good, too. Um, Just pick one. You get one more. That's I'm going to get one more. Okay. So this is... I actually like this shot a lot. Okay. This is a 50 Apo shot at 8,000 ISO, which was amazing at the time. Now, of course, the M10 monochrome right. just is like crazy. We're, we're spoiled. Now. We're so spoiled. <laughs> and it just performs really well under this really challenging lighting scenario. Stage lighting, uh, backlit, and super high contrast range. And it just nails it. And, and here is just... Here's a crop at 100%, and it is just pin sharp. This is 8,000 ISO? 8,000 ISO. On the, on the 246. On the 246 monochrome. Yeah. Not the M10 monochrome, yeah, the 246. Legit. This is on red.form, so you guys can go and check it out at your convenience. Yeah, um, anyway, that's all for me. That, I well, could show you pictures all day. We have time for a couple more questions. We've been going for a while, although we did have that short uh, break there, so we should get another five minutes. Um, mm, Okay. Um, Jose, what do we got? Anything do I have good? a Noctilux portrait example? Somewhere. I could probably find one if you want to handle a question. Uh, sure. Jose, what do you got for me? Anything? Yeah. Uh, let me see. If I want to shoot the 50 Sumilux M, uh, should I consider the original SL and the M adapter or the M rangefinder and the Visoflex? Ask it one more time. If you want to shoot... The 50 Sumilux. Um, He's saying that his eyesight is getting a little bit bad. Should he consider ah, the I original SL? Okay, okay. The, uh, now I understand. Yeah. It depends. The SL Type 601, the original SL, is larger 
So if your goal is to have the smallest camera possible, the M with the VisaFlex will be smaller. That said, the electronic viewfinder on the SL601 is vastly superior to the electronic viewfinder um, available for the M10. That's the VisaFlex, which is optional. So if the size of the camera, I mean, the SL is a bit bigger, it doesn't bother you, I'd probably go with an SL. There are also a lot of really good deals available on pre-owned SLs right now. They're far less expensive than even a 240 would be pre-owned. Um, so yeah, I'd probably lean towards an SL with the Amadapter L and go from there. Uh, is Julie mad we haven't answered her question? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Sorry, Julie, we just stole your lenses. <laughs> We're not answering your questions. Um, if only you answered your phone that one time when I called you. I'm, I, I would have answered your question. I'm so sorry. Sick burn. Sick burn. <laughs> um, so what, 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 is, what is Julie's question? I don't know. It was an email somewhere. She, um, this is what you get when you ask too far in advance. Uh, that's right. That's right. Let's see. I'll find it. Don't mind, don't mind me being on my phone. Let's see. Juliana. Uh, <laughs> this is, this is Just uh, get, talk among yourselves. When we, get to, when we get to the tail end of the show, we start to get delirious. Um, oh, okay. I, I found the Noctilux samples. Okay. Oh, did you? I Sweet. did. I did. Oh, I remember that. Yeah, those are cool. And I'm going to look for, oh, that's an Octolux shot. OK, um, how do I make this bigger on a Mac? Julie, oh. I'm trying to find your questions. I can't find them. Too bad. Too bad, so sad. OK, so <laughs> that's an Octolux. That's an Octolux. Wait, they can't see that, David. No, I know. I'm funny. OK, this is an Octolux. Let Sorry. me say this, too. Um, David has been going crazy with his reviews of the past decade. There's so much content on Red Dark Forum. Here. Again, this is this is my quintessential knock the luck shot. Um, don't like don't think that a review of a camera may not be relevant because you don't own that camera. Just look at the shots. Look at the lenses and the shots that he's taking with them, and then you'll see how a lot of this stuff works in practice. Okay, pop yeah. that up. Yes. Now that's not a portrait, but I just want to show Josh talk about the bokeh on on this particular. This shot. is a great example. This is a great shot too, David. Oh, I know just where this was taken, and this is a portrait. Just thought of a person. It's a portrait of a car, which yes, you like. I you like cars. Yeah. Here, the bokeh is a critical part mm -hmm. of the picture. The way the focus falls dramatically and how quickly it goes from tack sharp to totally blurred, how quickly it goes from, like, say, full luminance all the way to the vignetting in the corners, how the corners naturally darken. Um, unfortunately, you can't see the one corner of the image. All right, David I'm going to make actually, it. David is actually in. I'm um, going to make, yeah, I'm like covering the shot. So there here's an example of a shot that probably wouldn't be nearly as interesting if it was taken with a 50 Apo. Right. Even though the 50 Apo is quote unquote superior, mm -hmm. better, this shot is this shot because David is using the Noctilux's rendering of um, light points, of reflective surfaces, in this case, the water droplets and the metal in the car, because we can't see it now. Sorry, um, I'm, I'm actually, you know, yeah. okay. I was trying to find the other shot. To his yeah. advantage. So, the bokeh and the rendering of this lens is being used as part of the picture versus simply being there. Right. Sweet. And I think, so I have people, mm -hmm. people. I have Mac problems right now. Hold on. <laughs> David, you're a PC guy. There we go. Oh, okay. nice. Nope, that's not it. That's a nice shot, though. Yeah, but that's not a 50 knock clock. Okay. There we go. Okay. What do we got? What do we got? What do we got? I'm trying to find it. All right. Okay. How do you deselect? Mm -hmm. I think like that. Okay, here we go. With his Noctilux shot? No. Uh, we're, doing, we're doing great. No, no, no. We're doing amazing. We're very professional here. We, we got the live feed cutting out. You're fumbling around. Oh. I was trying to find a... Uh, David has probably uh, the most extensive and varied back catalog of Leica photography. Well, that's another one of... In the here. modern digital era. So, so, yeah, that's another one kind of similar, right? That's also a Noctilux shot. Yeah. I mean, look at the way that that focus falls off. I mean, that is oh, it's amazing. And the way the corners just kind of... Really come in. That is. Do you, um, by the way, notice that it, this is like a Leica script? <laughs> that is kind of funny. Yeah. Okay. And then um, with people, I have not that, not that. Like this is here. This is some people. Okay. Not really a portrait, but not a portrait. Cool but, shot though. Right. So this is taken at night, and you can kind of see the character of the lens and how it isolates even the foreground element, like mm -hmm. of the, you know, the the cafe awning. Yeah. I think I've sat at that exact table. Of with course, you, everyone sat at that exact table. <laughs> you and I have eaten there. Half of Miami Beach uh, has sat at that exact yeah. table. This is the News Cafe, which is like a South Beach institution on Ocean uh, Ocean Drive. Yeah. So these are night shots with a 240. Uh, and uh, yeah. Anyway, just to, to give you an idea of what the what the 0.95 Noctilux looks like. Yeah. Julie's content with an answer when we, when we talk to her tomorrow. So. Perfect. <laughs> I think she's fine.
Uh, lost us again. Oh no, more stream problems. Well, that's okay. Um, okay, we've been going for a while. Let's take like one or two more really cool questions. Um, if we have anything, Jose, what are, you, what are you digging up for us here? Yeah, what about the uh, Tri Elmar? You know, I didn't bring a Tri Elmar. I haven't talked about it a lot since maybe two or three episodes ago because it exists in a weird nexus. It's not a current lens. It's not a lens that you can really find that easily. They are relatively expensive for what you're getting. It's okay, image quality wise, wide open is probably on par with like a version three Summicron. It's not gonna blow your mind. The F4 uh, maximum aperture was was more of an issue five, six years ago than it is today because you've got such good high ISO performance. Right. Um, that lens is a fun lens similar to the F1 Noctilux. It's three focal lengths in one. It's not a lens I would use every day. Um, I just don't think you're getting the most of each focal length compared to the single primes. But if you're in a situation where you need that flexibility and you can't change the lenses, or you just want the look of a Trialmar, like, go for it. And they're cool. And they exist in a unique part of Leica's history. So, All yeah, right. that's my thoughts on that. Favorite 50 millimeter lenses? If you could choose one, David and Josh. I mean, 50 Apo, duh. Uh, I'm taking the Noctilux. Sorry, bro. 4.95. Only because I have my most like Instagram photos taken with the Noctilux, so <laughs> I have to. I have to. I, have to uh, I, I just think one of my favorite things to do with the Noctilux is, is what most people do is they put it at a meter, minimum distance, and they shoot like the shot you took. That's with the, exactly with that. The, um, the parky meter. What I like to do is actually shoot far away, mm. but still wide open with a center subject, and then just let the background fall off. And you can actually get almost like a tilt shift or, or miniaturization effect by taking advantage of that fo focus fall off without having the subject right in front of you. So if you own an Octolux, don't feel like all your shots have to be four or five feet away, wide open with a super blurred background. Try shooting something at a distance, but where there's still separation, just separation farther away. And you'll see, you can still get a lot of, of that effect um, and it really makes for something magical. I don't know. I think at night too, that lens is awesome. So I think the 50 Noctilux Pro 95 on the SL2 is one of the most fun setups um, that I've been able to play with. And I usually use a 60 millimeter polarizer on there because I drew cars and I like to have that um, reflection control. So David likes the Apo. David has killed it with the Apo over the past uh, seven or eight years. I mean, look, I, I'm gonna freely admit, I am, I'm someone who just chases perfection. I, I want, I want, that top quality. You know, I know we we make light of like, you know, we get the snarky answer of well, what's the best? It's like, <laughs> we're having fun. We the, obviously love the question. Well, what's please. the best for you? Yeah. Uh, and the reality, and that's why I kind of walked through earlier of saying, okay, here was my progression. I went from a classic Cron to a Sumalox, a Spheric, to the Apple Sumacron, hmm. because I feel that progression kind of says what I'm looking for in my photography, which is I'm I'm looking for that that next level of performance, mm. you know? And, and that's what takes me to the, uh, to the Apo versus the Noctilux, because while I can go out and shoot with the Noctilux, and it's a lot of fun, yeah. I just don't see myself using that every day. Yeah, yeah. You know, and it's what we talked about before of, it's a good fifth lens or yeah. sixth lens, you yeah. know, because it complements your regular kit of having that really special, you know. Freaking me out here. <laughs> that, really, that really special paintbrush when that's what you need to do, yeah. you know? Or if I know I'm going to Miami Beach and it's just full of neon and lights and like that environment just yeah. opens itself up to the Noctilux. But that's not what I'm shooting generally. So for me, I'm gonna to gravitate towards a smaller, lighter and sharper, easier to use lens. There you go. The 50 Apo is, is one of the greatest gifts that Leica has bestowed upon us because it's so small and so sharp and so good at everything that it's hard to use anything else when your objective is simply to get the highest level of image quality. Yeah. It's hard to, I mean, if that's your objective. Obviously, we've got a team full of amazing lenses that do a lot of different things, but yeah, we've been going for a while. Let's answer like, I keep saying one or two more questions, but- we're No, just... I think we really need to go one or two more questions. Okay, we're crushing it right now. What do we got? Uh, I don't know if we touch on this. Differences between the 50 Cron version three and four besides cosmetics. I mean, it's a new optical design. So higher contrast in the version four, sharper in, like, uh, sharper in the edges, although still not as sharp as 50 right. Apo. Um, the addition of a focus tab 
I guess that's more like a cosmetic. So I don't know, I forget the number of elements um, in either one of those things, but certainly what I will say is the version three is the first 50 that feels really modern to mm. me. Um, the version four continues to build on that. The bokeh between the two, it gets softer as you get newer. What I mean is even though they both have two Sumacrons, the, it's, it's what's, how do I say this? The, ident the ability to identify what it is that's out of focus becomes more difficult as you get newer because you have a softer bokeh that's less um, kind of, I call it spaghettified, like where you start seeing all kinds of stuff. The transition from brighter to darker areas becomes softer in the bokeh. That's a big, big difference as you get newer. So a light source or a bright object in the bokeh or in the, in the out of focus area, that transition from where it kind of the edge of that out of focus light source is to whatever it's in front of is a lot softer as you get newer. I think there's also a great resource um, that we talked about. Yes. Uh, this was actually done in coordination with the LHSA mm. and uh, a very knowledgeable fellow who's been at the LHSA forever. He's actually the editor of the Viewfinder magazine. Mm -hmm. Name's Bill Rosauer. And he actually published a guest post on Red Dot Forum. I'm gonna navigate there just so you guys see it. Yeah. And then I'll I'll drop links for this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a really cool article. Um, and it's right here. Look at that. Jose, can you pull up the old Computron? There we go. The comp Computron? The Computron. Okay, so this is called uh, Boca Kings, a look at 50 millimeter M lens. This is actually a few years old. This is uh, from 2014, but still very relevant because it compares some pretty cool lenses, even the 51.2 that we couldn't get a hold of. <laughs> She's and trying to make me jealous, aren't you? I know, trying to get you jealous. <laughs> so what's cool is, and also non-Leica lenses that are Nikon, or, or say Leica adapted, like like this Canon 51.2. Um, All kinds of funky yeah, stuff. Yeah, a Voigtlander, uh, another Voigtlander. Things we don't test because we don't Here, Here's about. a 50 Noctilux, oh, but look, cool. look at these swirls. Look at that, that is insane. Like that's that's wild. Oh my gosh, it's crazy. Yeah, so definitely put a, you're gonna put a link to this. You said yeah, yeah, because he really shows there's the nine a five. lot of different parts. Right, the and then wide open, and then stop down a little bit. Yeah, at yeah. different points of the image, and that's close really up cool. of the bokeh. So it's really cool. Uh, that's the f1. And yet, you know, here is the uh, collapsible Sumacron, and look at how well controlled that is, for instance, versus yeah. some of those Noctiluxes. Yeah. So it's pretty neat. Uh, I, I recommend, and we're talking about low contrast, by the way, like that's low contrast. Yeah, look at that. But um, yeah, and that's the, boop, 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 no. Wow, yeah, he's got a lot of stuff. There's so, a lot. Not all of them, but a lot. That's the aspheric there. Yeah. So I definitely checked this out. It's called uh, Boca Kings on, on, Red on Red Dot Forum. Yeah. Pretty cool. Anyway, it's not, let's say, as comprehensive as every single lens on this table, but it is pretty neat because there's some some cool lenses and non Leica lenses thrown in there to answer those. Well, what about this lens that's didn't like it didn't make and is adapted and yeah. whatever. Now you can see. All right. Anything else? Super critical. Oh, dude, I, I gotta get a close up on this while we're looking. Jose, can we get a little? Um, this is. Uh, I want to thank Javier for letting me borrow this lens. So the Sumacron, excuse me, the Sumalux 50, what they call the version three, which was the last version before the current ASPH Sumalux, the last run of them, I think from 95 on, were an E46 filter size with a retractable shade, much like the modern version. They made them in black, silver, titanium, and then black paint. So this is, am I sharp? I can't tell, yes. This is a 50 Sumalux version three, pre-aspheric black paint with a brass barrel on a black paint MP. If this is not the most beautiful thing you've ever seen, I don't know. Oof. I mean, this is, I love black paint lenses. They, the way that they brass and wear is incredible. Um, this lens just got a, a CLA at Leica, so it's really nice to use, it's six-bit coated. And this combo is wow. stunning. Wow. The version three is a lot of fun because it's almost Noctilux-like, except you get a little more depth of field, but it handles and works in terms of like the focus and aperture like a modern 51.4 spheric. So these are really fun. If you can find one of these in black paint, or even the regular black um, anodized copies are really, really cool. I was playing with one on the SL2 the other day. I shot a picture of the dog with it, and it just looked really, really cool. Really dramatic fall off, delicate rendering, super soft in the center, something fun. So this uh, this lens is not for sale. This camera may or may not be for sale, depending on how much I like you. But um, I just wanted to show off this really, really, really beautiful combination of black paint 
uh, camera and lens. Mm. Julie's watching this right now going, why the hell I have that? <laughs> you can. Uh, sorry. There's, there's some, some questions about the, uh, the 1.5. Oh, the Sumerit. Yeah. So the Sumerit 1.5, which we haven't really talked about, is, you know, these lenses, okay, th what I will say is this. Of all the lenses on this table, this Sumerit 1.5 has the most distinct bokeh. I'm not saying it's the best bokeh. <laughs> it's just very, very distinct. <laughs> Extremely low contrast. Basically, nothing is sharp. Um, very, very unique. Not that expensive, sort of hard to get. This one's actually a thread mount. I only am using it because I couldn't get an M mount. Well, that has an M mount adapter on it. They made these in thread mount and in M. Um, so very, very vintage look. Uh-oh. Lower contrast, yeah, <laughs> Jillian's texting us, I know. Lower contrast than the F1 Noctilux. Um, crazy, crazy poke. I mean, it's just like half moons and weird shapes and all kinds of banana stuff. Brass barrel, nice and solid. Um, fun, a fun lens. But not a, not a lens I use regularly. We don't see these very often in the shop. Um, Gary lends us this one. Thank you, Gary. But if you're looking for a fast vintage 50 and you don't want to spend the money on a Sumalux, this is a good option. Mm -hmm. And they've proven to be, you know, good. I will say their coatings are very soft. So yeah. inspect them before you buy them to make sure there's no cleaning marks or haze or anything in the in the uh, in the optics because that's I know an issue. That would be a good compliment to a modern yes. Sumatron, for instance. Yes. That's kind of what we're getting at. Is yes, that, yes, yes. Yeah. Okay, I, I seriously think we've done everything we can. Oh my gosh, yeah. I like this. One, one Andrew said, <laughs> one more. I need a cold shower after seeing that combo with okay. black paint. Jose, like Jose, Jose's, got, <laughs> Jose's got something for us. All right, I should show this too. Our, well, Any comments on the 50 Sumar and or Sumitar? Those are screw mount lenses. Those are adapted, yeah. Which we're not, I have no issue with them, but this is M-mount lenses only. If I mean, I, we have if, enough problems getting right, through all these. Right, yeah. right, right. If I, if I knew, my our expertise really starts with M-mount. There's a lot of incredible people out there that know a lot about the screw mount. Like is, the LHSA. Which is a huge part of Leica's history. Mm -hmm. So I would defer to the LHSA and their expertise. You can ask an expert on LHSA's uh, yeah. website. LHSA.org. We'll down in the description. Yep. Um, so I'll mention that. This, probably the funniest thing on this table, this is an Infinity Stop ND lens. Um, I, just, I just grabbed this because this is a... It's cool though. This is a DuPont edition of the Noctilux where they made 95 of them. And it only has the writing on here where it says 0.95, except there's one thing, this lens, you don't want to put this on your camera because you're never going to get a sharp picture. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, uh, this is actually a store display that's like a dummy. It doesn't even turn. I just thought it was really all, cool. It does, all, all, yeah. it does have a hood that actually retracts. Um, yeah. I couldn't resist, just as a fun thing. I almost wanted to put this on a camera and be like, it's, uh, all my pictures are black. Um, but if you can actually get your hands on one of the real DuPont Noctiluxes, those things are oh, yeah. wild. Um, it looks just like this, um, with all blacked out text, just the point ninety five writing on it. Really, really cool. Um, anyway, now we're getting off into crazy tangents. There can't possibly be anything else. We've got been going on for I feel, I feel thirty seven like hours. I feel like we've covered it all. Fifty all right. Noctilux version two. Uh, they're all the same optically. The, the three, the four versions of the F one, just as far as I know. Point ninety five. Um, well, there's only one version. Update. What? They're asking if if they should wait for the updated version. The, what? There's not going to be an updated version. <laughs> the lens, it's, I mean, who knows what we'll see in 50 years, but the Noctilux is not that old in the terms of yeah. Leica lenses, so I don't see, yeah, I don't. If anything, they need to update the 514, the Spheric. Not that that's a bad lens, but, you know, if we're going to be talking about, right. we don't know what Leica's plans are. We always talk about that. Like, we, we love to speculate. Although, listen, I feel like I want to start a revolution with, we, we're, we were talking about this because, we're huge fans of the Sumerit range, not just the 50, the mm. 35, the mm -hmm. 75. Mm -hmm. They're great lenses. So good. Discontinued. Ah, it breaks my heart. Why are they discontinued, Josh? Because you people didn't buy them. And now you're realizing how good they are. You're driving at the prices on the used market. And, you and know, they're gone. It was good while it lasted, people. But I tried, I've been trying to, to, to praise the virtue of the Sumerits for years. Super small, super light, super sharp, modern design. But mm. everyone, everyone wants to... This, you you want your luxes? Lux. You got your luxes. There we go. Well, yeah. That's an end of rant. But listen, maybe we should start like a petition or something and be like, okay, there is a thousand people that want, you know. Yeah, I tried to get an Elcan and failed miserably. So sorry. Um, 
cool beans dude. <laughs> Let's have <to> about that. <laughs> um, some of this stuff is so rare, and we only have a couple of days, really, and when it yeah. comes down to, to actually gather this stuff up. So I, I am a bit limited to what I can get. But if anyone has an Elcan and wants to let me borrow it, and I'll talk about it on a future episode, I'll give you some candy or something. I don't know. Um, I'd appreciate it. All right. So wrapping up. We're done. We're going to leave some links if I can remember all the things. <laughs> Somebody take notes somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, as always, if you have questions that we didn't get to, obviously, we can only talk about so many things for so long. Uh, leave it in the comments, and we will do our best to go through there. Uh, just a public service announcement. I am actually going on a family vacation for the better part of two weeks, and we'll have spotty internet access. I'm going out in nature, where I like to take pictures. Wow. Yeah, I know, right? He's, um, he's testing the Noctual version too, right? I shouldn't be saying that. Don't even say that. <laughs> You're going to get me in trouble. <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, I'm not testing anything. I'm just having a nice time with my What family. are you taking, though? I want to know what gear you're going to take. I'm not saying, because I haven't decided yet. That's okay, true. I have decided. Yes, you have. I'm a no, I'm not saying on this episode. <laughs> we'll talk about it later. You have not decided it. Uh, I'm uh, undecided. I'm just calling David out. And giving him a I'm good, undecided. Good hard time. Um, but I will do my best between you know hiking and making s'mores to uh, get to your questions. If I don't get to you right away, understand it's because I'm on the road. And I'll probably monitor a little bit as well. And Josh can um, monitor as well. And you can always email us, DM us on Instagram. But we will be back yes. on August. Oh, we got to talk about what we're talking about in two weeks, our next show. Our next show is near and dear to my heart. It is buying and selling tips for use like a year. Mm -hmm. So whether you're buying something pre-owned, trading something, trying to sell something privately, uh, I'm not going to be doing appraisal, so please don't try no, asking me what no. such and such is worth. This isn't, this isn't like, like a road show. No. no. What, what we're going to talk about is things to look for, tips for how to get the most out of your gear when you're selling it, what to look for when you're buying, all that stuff. So that's going to be in two weeks. So think about questions you've got or good or bad experiences you've had buying and selling pre-owned gear and want advice on. That's what we're going to be talking about. Mm -hmm. So it's mm -hmm. going to be awesome. I can't wait. Um, okay. And, uh, Sign us off, David. Uh, yeah. And then, listen, if you have ideas for things that you would like us to spend two hours of our life talking about, <laughs> please leave it in the comments. We are always happy to take your suggestions. I'm also going to take a look back what you guys said for timing in terms of Saturday, Sunday, mm -hmm. 7, 8, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, and we'll maybe put up a poll officially you know, on the channel so you guys can vote. Do that. Yeah. Speaking of the channel, please, uh, if you like the video, give us a thumbs up. It helps. makes us feel good. And also, subscribe to the channel so you know that when we post content like this or things like the M10R review uh, that we had on the, uh, that we do in regular produce videos. So um, yeah, I think that's it. And then also check out red.forum.com for just gobs of information on all of this stuff and the latest uh, news and updates and things like that. So thanks again to Josh. Good night, everybody. Thanks to Jose. Good night, everybody. And uh, Peter and Kirsten, thanks in the comments. And thanks to you guys for watching. We always appreciate it. And we'll see you in two weeks. Thanks. Have a good one. Bye-bye.